Talk Radio. Bichamo Apura Kanu Apura Kaitnu Ineye Eguada Medinde Ojirapo Kwesi Radneham Puta Akar Akwamumaira Maruka Etipi Mu Ojirapo. I mean, bringing to all Apura Kani Apura Kaitnu people, meaning Africans, black people today, is Eguade Marketplace Day. My name is Ojirapo Kwesi Radneham Puta Akan. Akwamu Maira Maruka Etipi Mu Ojirapo, that means the Ojirapo of the Akwamu Nation in North America. Um, you know, say we thank you for tuning in to this special um, broadcast of Ekwada Marketplace Day. We normally have it on Wednesday, La Wukuda. Of course, we you know, we typically showcase an Apurakani, Apuraitaitni, or African business, organization, and so forth, where we talk about the philosophy of why we approach business, commerce, from an Afurakani, Afurakani perspective. Um, we decided to have this particular show moving from yesterday to today. Of course, today, people are brainwashed with the foolish um, pseudo-holiday of Christmas. Today is actually a Yauda, which is a Thursday, which is the day of the Abosom, of the deity Yao in our Khan culture. The deity Yao is also called Soro, which is the same deity as Horo or Heru in ancient Kemet. Heru also has the title Eshao in ancient Kemet as well. So since this is Yao Da, this is Thursday, the day of Yao, Nana Yao, the day of the Abosom, Heru. And it's also the nonsensical, foolish, Pseudo holiday of Christmas. We're going to get into that and we're going to get into our work, Kukutuntun, the ancestral jurisdiction, where we prove conclusively Jesus never existed, Moses never existed, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael never existed, Muhammad never existed, Allah, Yahweh, the Elohim, all these different fictional cartoon characters never existed in any form of it in any race whatsoever. Buddha as well and, and all the others. We're going to focus on Osar, Aset, and Heru, and, you know, the nonsense with regard to how Christianity was manufactured. Um, we're just sending out a couple of notes right now, just to make sure people who had indicated they were joining in the discussion know that we started. We normally have our broadcast on this particular broadcast at 9 p.m. Eastern um, on Awukuda on Wednesdays. Um, but we want to do this during the day. We didn't want to wait until the evening. We want, wanted people to, you know, have the opportunity to get some detailed information right in the midst of all of the nonsense. So um, we're going to put some links in the chat room so individuals can see that. Um, we're going to have to reboot the chat room, um, make sure it comes up properly. So this looks, looks like we're going to have to pull that back up. But um, the link that we're going to put in, of course, is the Kukutun Tun, the ancestral jurisdiction. If you're on the phone line, ojirafo.com, O-D-W-I-R-A-F, as in free, O.com. And you can go to the publications page, and all of our publications are there. Um, one of them is Kukutun Tun, the ancestral jurisdiction. You want to... Um, click on that, and we just, okay, the chat room is up now, the chat room is open, and we just want to make sure we have one more link we need to send out, and we'll get started. Um, of course, if anybody has any questions or comments, if you're in the chat room, you have to log in, you can't, you can't interact as a guest. So you must log in with the username. If you don't have a username, then you can sign up for one uh, quickly. Um, if you're on the phone line, just hit the number one, and then we can see that you are your hand is raised and we can uh, connect with you. Okay, we're just sending out the last note. Okay. And, and for those who are new, uh, we Again, we have we have actually have three shows um, on a weekly basis. 
on Joada, Denada, and Awukuda, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, on Monday, Joada, we have Akampo Nanasom, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion. So we talk about Nanasom, Afurakani, Afurakani, Ancestral Religion, or African Ancestral Religion, but specifically the Akan expression of Nanasom. So they're Hence, Akan Fo Nanasong, Akan Ancestral Religion, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion, because there's a great deal of misinformation regarding Akan Ancestral Religion. Of course, we are Akan, but when you study Akan Ancestral Religion or any Ancestral Religion from any Afura Akani, Afura Akani group, fundamentally the principles and the structure are, are the same. There are differences in language, but we still deal with the Great Mother and the Great Father, the Supreme Being the forces in nature, the deities, the ancestresses and ancestors who are honorable, and our relationship to them in plant life, animal life, mineral life, Afurakani, Afurakani, human life, our relationship to the forces in nature, our ancestresses and ancestors who are honorable, and the supreme being. So that same structure you'll find across the board because it's the structure of creation. The only difference is between different um, Afurakani, Afurakani groups, Africans, ethnic groups is the language that we use to express these things, and then certain um, unique expressions of culture, whether, whether it's a specific form of ritual song or ritual dance or the way we structure our homes and, and villages and so forth, that's unique to the group. But as far as the structure of creation and our place in creation, it's all fundamentally the same. So anytime you study one um, ancestral religious expression, you're, you're really studying them all outside of the language, the specific language of the group. All right, so we, we have that on Joada Mondays. On Binada Tuesdays, Abinada, we have Ojira, which means purification. Ojira, as we say, operationalizes Nanason. Purification operationalizes ancestral religion. So we talk about ancestral religion in general. We deal with texts from ancient Kemet, give a proper understanding of these texts, how they relate to various cultures on the continent, as well as our, our ancestral religion as we brought it here to the Western Hemisphere during the Musuo Kesi, the great perversity, the enslavement era. We continue to practice the same ancestral religion that we brought from ancient Kanat and Kemet, ancient Nubia and Egypt, to the West and Central and Southern parts of the continent. And then after we were forced, some of us from those regions to the Western Hemisphere, we continued to practice the same ancestral religion, those of us who were, you know, strong enough to do so. And the ones who did maintain our ancestral religious practices, it is those individuals who were the only individuals who were successful at accomplishing what many of our people talk about accomplishing right now, which is liberation from the whites and their offspring, the ones who continue to embrace their ancestral religion. Those are the ones who wage war against the whites and their offspring, free themselves from plantations, kill the whites and their offspring, burn down plantations, liberated others, and established independent communities right in North America, right, of course, in the Caribbean, South America, independent nations. And we defended them intergenerationally. So, for example, we talked about Dismal Swamp in Virginia, Carolina, and um, for, for years, for decades, you have people who escaped from enslavement, went into the Dismal Swamp, built homes, engaged in agriculture, raised their children and their children's children and their grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so forth, and were never taken back, back into enslavement. When the whites and offspring would send troops, um, you know, cadres of individuals, militias, to go into the Dismal Swamp and try to drag those people back into enslavement. Our people met them with force, with military. We stole guns and so forth. We waged war against the whites and offspring to the point where they asked for a peace treaty because they couldn't penetrate and they couldn't drag us back into slavery. So that happened, that Dismal Swamp is just one example. And we did a broadcast where we talked about independent Afurakani, Afurakani communities. Uh, last week we did that broadcast, so the archive is there, you can listen to it, which was actually Egua on Marketplace Day, talking about a number of different communities in 
uh, the United States uh, during the enslavement era that, where we freed ourselves and established our own sovereignty and defended our sovereignty intergenerationally. The same thing, of course, happened in Jamaica, for example, with the Maroon Societies in South America, with the Quilombos and so forth, of course, with Haiti, with them taking over the whole island. Of course, it happened in St. John, Cinnamon Bay, the Aquamu, Subakan group, took over the island for a while. So wherever we continue to maintain our ancestral religious practices, then we freed ourselves and established our sovereignty and maintained our sovereignty. Those who rejected ancestral religion or were people who were born into enslavement, sent to another plantation, raised up its children and never knowing anything about their culture and anything like that, then continue to live amongst, you know, the population and embracing white culture, not knowing any better. And those who those are the individuals who maintained and continued to live you know, on the plantations until emancipation. But it was the warriors and warriors said, Akofo, the warriors, warriors says, who waged war against the whites in their offspring, killed the whites in their offspring on such a consistent basis, generating various resistance movements, insurrections, rebellions, and so forth, that we forced emancipation because we were slaughtering the whites in their offspring like Nat Turner and, and many others. So what they did is what some of our people are still trying to do. Talk about Pan African, Pan Africanism, liberation, freedom, and so forth. But none of the organizations and individuals who talk about these different things over the decades or the past century, none of the various groups have been successful in liberating our people and establishing our sovereignty. Only the individuals who maintain the ancestral religious culture did so. So, of course, that is the model that we would use to look towards and build upon to liberate ourselves. We don't look to failed models where people have been talking about the same thing for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, and never liberated anyone. Why would we try to resurrect those models that have failed when you have a model of precedent set by your blood ancestresses and ancestors right here that established real sovereignty? So we deal with that. We deal with that kind of information um, in on Ojira Da, which is Abinada Abinada Tuesday um, on our program Ojira. And then, of course, marketplace. As we said, Ekwa Marketplace Day. We often showcase a business organization, um, products and service. Have people come on and talk about their businesses and so forth. Um, if you would like to come on the show, you have an Afurakani Afurai Kaini African business that serves the Afurakani Afurakaiti community, but also you maintain our ancestral values at the same time, then those are the kinds of businesses that we promote. For example, we wouldn't promote a black-owned, you know, Christian business or a black-owned um, business that's promoting Islamic values or some nonsense like that. An Afurakani Afurakaiti business, African business, organization, home school, whatever it is, that serves the community in a positive capacity, but also maintains our ancestral values, not foreign criminal values, but our ancestral values. That's what we promote. Okay. And, um, okay, so we're going to, so those are the, <clears throat> excuse me, those are the um, three different shows. Uh, and also, and for those who just came in, look, look in the chat room. We posted the link to the book, Tukutuntum, The Ancestral Jurisdiction. We'll post the link back up. You can go directly there. And also, we also want to say that um, with regard to our Nhoma publications, when you go to our publications page, and we'll put the link in the chat room right quick, you go to the publications page, uh, you'll see that we have 15 books to date. Um, we are working on more, and they will be coming out. We have 15 right now. The ebook versions of all 15 books are we have made them available as free downloads from our website. So you can download the entire book, all of them for free. The soft cover versions of our 15 books, we print them in house on our own printers in color. Um, we do sell the soft cover versions. They range between eight and $11, 
Um, about eight of them are nine dollars. Five of them are ten dollars. One is eleven, and one is eight dollars. So um, we do sell those. So please support the work. If anybody orders ten books or more, it's automatically thirty percent off. So a ten book set, eleven book set, twelve book set, thirteen book set, or fourteen book set or fifteen book set. Sometimes people will order the entire fifteen book set because they only range between eight and eleven dollars. So it's automatically 30% off. So you basically, for example, 10 books um, with the 30% off is $66 for 10 books plus shipping. Um, for the entire 15 book set, it's uh, $99. That's 30% off as opposed to like 130, 140 or something like that. It's basically $99 for 15 books. So that's, of course, less than $10 per book. Um, so get out there to the individuals who have ordered um, the 10 book set or 11 book set or the entire 15 book set, um, and you can go to the and you can order one book or or however many you want, whatever mix of titles you would like. Just go to the uh, publications page, and finally we also have Noquadefo, which is our term for distributors. Noquade means truth. Noquadefo are those who disseminate truth. If you would like to be a distributor of our soft cover publications, you would like to generate income for yourself, additional income or just income in general if you're not working, it doesn't matter what your past work history is, you simply purchase the books from us wholesale, which is 30% off, and we also um, share the shipping cost with you, split it with you. Um, you purchase them for 30% off wholesale, and then you sell them at the regular retail price. So that's just, we have that, when you go to the publications page, you'll see all the publications there, but we also have on that page also a video, no quite a full, um, dealing with a short orientation about how to become no quite a full. We also have the no quite a full distributor information document, PDF document on the site as well, on the same page, where you can download that, learn about being a no quite a full, um, and all the wholesale prices and retail prices and so forth, and the entire procedure, which is very simple. You just basically order the books wholesale from us, and then we ship them out, of course, and then you share them with friends, family, coworkers, people you are come in contact with, people you work with, and so forth. And typically when the people see the books, they sell themselves. When they see the color, you know, publications, they see the images of the divinities, and they see the titles and things like that, then people are interested, and once they see that you have the book and they ask you where you got it from, you say, actually, I, I sell them, and they only range between 8 and $11, and most of them are 9 9 or $10. Um, people, you know, they can pull out a $10 bill and give you, you know, and purchase a book. When they see a book like the one we're going to talk about right now, the Cuckoo Tum Tum, the ancestral jurisdiction, and on the front cover, not only is there an image, color image of Osara set in Heru, but it says right on the front cover that Jesus never existed, Moses never existed, Muhammad, Bilal, Allah, you know, Yahweh, all these fictional characters, people are automatically interested. And when they see it's only $10, then you can easily, the books sell themselves. So once you order them wholesale, it would, it's not a problem um, moving product. And this is a way for us to be able to employ our people while they're, you know, selling something that's actually benefiting our people but also benefiting the, the one who's selling the Noquati Fo to generate income for yourself. All right, so um, let's get into this text. Kuku Tum Tum, the ancestral jurisdiction. And the reason we put the information out, started out as an audio three CD set. We've taken all, all of the files, the MP3 files of the original three CD set, and they are on the website you can download and listen to them, of course, for free. And then the book itself is a transcript, word for word, of course, of the entire three CD set. So the 80-page book is a transcript of that. In addition to that, we have additional information at the end of different sections. We have images of the divinities, hieroglyphs that support what we're saying in the text. Of course, we have uh, bibliography where we show the various texts from ancient Kemet where these concepts can be found. And when you look at those various texts, you'll be all of them are you can find them in various places online. You can download them immediately. So for example, we have the Pert M Heru, the papyrus of Ani, 
parts of Hunefer, we'll sh the track number, um, and we'll have the specific uh, text that's associated with the specific track. So track number two, six, seven, and eight, the Pertim Heru, Papyrus of Ani, as well as the Papyrus of Hunefer. When you go to those papyri and study them, and you can download them from the Internet, um, you'll see that the information there supports what's in that particular track or that particular section. So we have that laid out, the hymn to Amen, Nessie Men Papyrus, the hymn to Hapi, Lamentations of Aset and Nebuchadnezzar, the Shabaka text, text of Pyramid text of Teta and Pepi, Tomb of Seti I, um, uh, hymn to Asar from the Stele of Amin Mes, Tomb of Nefertari, the Peru Kain Su M. Waset, Nefer Hetep, the Temple of Kain Su, Temple of Tehuti, Heru Behudet, Banabdada, um, Tekken of Hashepsu, the narrative of Set, often called the Metronic um, Stele, all these different texts you can download from the internet. And when you study them and see the various tracks where we lined them up, when you study these entire texts, you'll see that all of these texts from Ancient Command support everything that we're talking about um, in, the, in the book. So that's part of the bibliography. Of course, we have some other texts as well. And so we'll get into it. So we put the information out to prove that Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Moses, Aaron, Solomon, Sheba, Menelik, Jesus, Yeshua, Ben Pandera, Allah, Yahweh, Buddha, Brahman, all of these characters are absolutely fictional. Fictional cartoon characters who never existed of any race whatsoever. We put the information out because when we look and, you know, investigated, nobody gave proper etymologies and the proper cosmology to prove where these characters came from, not only their names, but their stories, where they came from, and the cosmology that supports these names, functions, and etymology. Nobody had done that. Yes, there were some European writers who talked about, you know, there were 16 crucified saviors and so forth. That's basic information. Anybody who reads about Osara, Set, and Heru can recognize readily that the death and resurrection of the Savior comes from that story. And then when you look all around the quote-unquote ancient world, you see the same story manifested because our people migrated from Afuraka, Afurakai, into southern Europe, the so-called Near East, um, and the East. And we carried, of course, our culture with us. So these are not different crucified saviors from different cultures. That is not accurate. It is the same culture. When we migrate, it's like if you might, people migrate from Mississippi to Chicago. They still, the people who are still in Mississippi, in comparison to the people who are in Chicago, they still speak the same language, they're the same people, they, they operate the same way, they're the same family. And some of them migrated to California, and some migrated to New York, or some went to Canada, or some went to Ghana, or some went to um, Australia. They're the same people speaking the same language and carrying the same culture. So when we migrated from Afuraka, Afuraka, into Southern Europe, into the so-called Near East, the so-called Middle East, into Asia, Southern Asia, and so forth, we carried the same language, we carried the same culture. So when you see these various titles of quote-unquote crucified saviors around the ancient world, it's because we carried our exact same culture everywhere we went, into North, Central, and South America when we migrated there thousands of years ago as well or here thousands of years ago as well. So this is why you will find that. But with regard to where does the Jesus character come from, where does the name Jesus come from, the function associated with this character, nobody gave detailed information about that. Same thing with the character Muhammad, for example. We proved that the deity Hatmet or Mu Hatmet, waters Mu of Hatmet, the northern Nile deity, Muhammad is the name of that divinity, and his cosmology that surrounds that divinity and his function in creation as a spirit that animates the river, we were able to prove that Muhammad is where they get Muhammad from, and the story about Muhammad and his functioning, his placing in the world and so forth, is totally stolen from this river deity. There was no Muhammad who ever existed at all, not a black one, not a white one. The same is true for Jesus, Yeshua, 
Moses, and so forth. So not only did the white scholars get the information wrong outside of something basic like their crucified saviors and Osara Set and Heru as the source, but beyond that, they get the information wrong. The problem comes in, of course, and of course, the ones who know some information, they're going to deliberately lie about it anyway. The problem comes in when you have black scholars, Akurakani, Akurakani people, reading the work of people like Gerald Massey, for example, and other white scholars, and then they simply repeat the misinformation coming from these white scholars. But because they're black or because they're quote-unquote Afrocentric, then people assume that what they're saying is true. So then they simply repeat or put in their own words the words of white writers, and then they perpetuate false information. So, for example, you have the book African Background of Medical Science written by Dr. Charles Finch, and he has his article, The Chemite Origins of Christianity, and what he does basically is repeat the information basically word for word with regard to the origins of these different characters in the Bible directly from Gerald Massey, the Achiwadifo, the spirit of disorder, the white writer who wrote in the previous, um, in, in the late, quote unquote, 1800s into the 1900s. So, um, all of the, just about every single etymology for the names of these various characters in the Bible put forward by Gerald Massey are totally inaccurate. So, for example, Abraham, you'll say Abraham, or the desire to serve Ra is Abraham, and this is where Abraham comes from. Totally false. You sue the ever coming son, being the origin of the term Jesus. Totally false. Yahweh, the waxing and waning moon, totally in inaccurate. His etymologies for Isaac and Ishmael and various other characters, totally false. And then you have him talking about Yeshua, Ben Pandera, or Jesus, Ben Panther, and so forth. And this being the uh, historical Jesus, where then the fictional Jesus is the, you know, the sun deity, totally false. Now, of course, Gerald Massey put out that false information, but Dr. Finch, just assuming that he had the right information, continued to promote that information, which was inaccurate. We have to scrutinize. We should not just accept what the White Snarl Springs say. We need to scrutinize that because you have other Afrocentric scholars as well, where people identify themselves as African-centered, Afrocentric, Afrocentric, having Afrocentric methodology and so forth, who continue to perpetuate false information because they did not scrutinize. The key, as we talked about previously in one of our broadcasts, is akom and unkom. Akom means spirit possession, unkom means spirit communication. When you actually invoke these divinities, these, these abosom, these orishas, these untoru, untorutu, neturu, netutu, and so forth, communicate with them, learn from them, then you can be directed to actual information tangible, tangibly that our ancestors and ancestors wrote that confirms what the Abosom tell you spiritually because, of course, we wrote everything down. We were the first people to do that. So that's how you can gain accurate information, and this is how we did, dealt with this process. So we're able to produce not only the proper etymologies and prove it in the text that already exists, of course, but the cosmology that gives birth to these names and these functions and so forth, and then show how the whites and offspring stole the information and corrupted it deliberately. So this is the proper approach. Many of our people, deep down inside, they think ancestral religion is inferior. They think it's primitive. They think it's foolish because they're still brainwashed by the whites and their offspring, even though they claim to be Afrocentric. So they would rather study misinformation from the whites and their offspring pseudo-esoteric information, hermeticism, the Kabbalah, Sufism, and, and other kinds of nonsense, Vedanta, and try to craft that into the culture of ancient Kabbalah and say, well, this is what our ancestors and ancestors were talking about. This is the ancient arcane spirituality that our people were dealing with, which is, of course, it is not. That pseudo-metaphysical nonsense is simply what it is, nonsense. When you actually deal with the real ancestral religion, you can see that. If you're enamored with the whites and their offspring, but you're too embarrassed to say that, so you pretend like you're Afrocentric or culturally grounded, but you're embracing white pseudo-metaphysics and then you wrap a black veneer around it to 
try to make it palatable to yourself and to other people you're communicating with, then you're just doing our people's disservice. Just be honest, say you're still brainwashing, enamored with the whites in their offspring, and learn something so then you can reject the nonsense. So what we did was we went in, got the real information, and put it forward, and anybody can study this information. So the first thing we say in the book, which comes from our Antimapo, it says, follow in the footsteps of your elder ancestresses and ancestors, for to follow the balanced path of those who have walked ahead of you is to embrace your truthery and balance your life. Realize that you do not exist alone. Your independence is only a measure of your proper functioning within the web of interdependence in creation. Your place in the world only reveals the larger function of your ancestral clan. Apura Kanu, Apura Titan, remember your truthery, and you will remember the divine function given to you in your beginning by the great ancestral spirit and the means by which you must execute that function in life through your ancestral culture. If you forget and you return and embrace the path to understand it is not taboo. So we follow in the footsteps of our elder ancestresses and ancestors. They laid this process out, and we still communicate directly with them. The same, just like we're on the same earth mother, the same sun is shining on us, the same oceans and rivers and the atmosphere and the stars and planets and so forth are the same as they were thousands of years ago. We're still being warmed by the same sun and fed by the same earth mother and nourished and replenished and rejuvenated by the same rivers and oceans and so forth and the atmosphere, the same asunsum or spirits that animate the earth mother, animate the sun, animate the black substance of space, planets, stars, rivers, oceans, atmosphere, thunder and lightning and so forth are the same asunsum or spirits. They're the same abosum, the same deities, the same orisha, the same ntoru, ntorotu, misnomered neteru, netetu, and so forth, they're the same one. So just like it is in the physical, it's the same in the spirit. The same abosom, the akan term for deity, and the term abosom comes from bosum in ancient Kemet, which is a term for deity, the descriptive title for deity. Um, the same forces that animate creation that we communicated with and were possessed by ritually in the past, Thousands of years ago, these are the same spirits that possess our people now, communicate with our people now, um, are behind the divinatory practice that we, practices that we engage in today. So when we talk about Afsar, Afset, Heru, and so forth, these same deities possess us, communicate with us today, just like they did in the past. So let's get into, we're going to go down, um, we're going to get straight into the information. So if you look in the book, if you go down to page, um, we're just scrolling through right quick, go to page um, 28 in the book. And we talk the part one of Aparakani, Aparakani, ancestral religion. And we talk about law being the expression of order, divine law is the expression of divine order. The laws governing Akurakani, Akuraikani society are expressions of divine order. The fundamental principle is the balance of male and female, amen and amenet, the great father and the great mother. Ra and Ra'et are the creator and creatress. They are subordinate to amen and amenet. In fact, they are grandchildren of amen and amenet. The great being, amen and amenet, direct Ra and Ra'et, the creator and creatress, to create the universe. There's a difference between the supreme being and the creator and creator. We talk about ka and ka'et. We talk about ma'a and ma'at, the male and female force of divine law and balance. People hear about ma'at all the time, but they don't hear about ma'a, the male divinity who has always existed, who we've always invoked and we continue to invoke ritually. But again, when people identify themselves as Afrocentric or African-centered, Afri-centric or culturally grounded or scholars or linguists or priests or priestesses or elders and eldresses or queen mothers and kings and Baba, Ia and Nana and all these different things, yet they're betrayed by the fact that they've never dealt with these actual divinities. 
They've read what the White and Offspring said. They've incorporated that. They've done a little meditation based on what the White and Offspring said, mimic some rituals, and then create organizations and groups and, and so forth and structures talking about ancient culture, but they've never really dealt with these actual divinities. If they did, Ma'al, they would have listened to him, and they would have been invoking him and been talking about Ma'al all along, in addition to Ma'at. They would have been talking about Amenet and Amenet Ra'et in addition to Amen. They would have been talking about Ra'et to create trust as well as Ra if they were invoking her, if they were invoking Amenet, if they were invoking Ma'al, they would know who these divinities are and they would be able to speak with regard to them and when they do divination, they would manifest. The communication would come from these divinities as well. But since most of our people have not been doing that, they've been mimicking the whites and their offspring, studying white New Age material, placing it in blackface, and then presenting it to us as ancient African. Then that whole uh, structure, that whole approach has been betrayed now. We talk about the balance, the divine balance. We get into that here, and then we talk about, which is key, our Aparakani Aparakani names and language, our dances, songs, exercises, prayers, chants, marriages, meditations, initiations, clothing, our use of medicines, oils, colors, gems, jewelry, our hairstyles, foods, the designs of our buildings, shrines, villages are all rooted in the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance in our life activity. All are rooted in Apurakani, Apuraikaitni, ancestral religion. And all are essential to our ability to create and get, live good lives. The ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance, that is the definition of Nana Soma, Apurakani, Apuraikaitni, meaning African ancestral religion. And of course, we have the book Apuraka, Apuraikai, at the origin of the term Africa, where we prove conclusively through the culture as well as the language that the term Afuraka is the origin of the term Africa. It does not come from a Roman general. It doesn't come from Greek, Roman, Sanskrit, um, Arabic, Phoenician, any of that. We prove conclusively and show the actual medusu of the term Afrika in ancient Kemet in more than one instance, which, again, disproves the misinformation that many quote-unquote Afrocentric scholars have been propagating re- regarding the origin of the term Africa. We also show that the term al Kapalan is an Arabic title and it's not an ancient name. And we prove that. So, but Akurakani Akurakani and such religion is the root of our culture, the foundation of our culture, and everything that we engage in revolves around that. The ritual incorporation of law, the ritual restoration of divine balance. So we just wanted to get there. Scroll down and we're going to get straight to this information here with regard to the fictional character. Jesus. I want to get to this page number, get to page number, um, page number 44. Kukutuntum, the ancestral jurisdiction for the people who just came in. First thing is key, when we talk about the deities, the Abosom, the Orisha, the Vodou, and so forth, these are the Asunsum, or the spirits that animate creation. Just like your spirit animates your physical body, just like the spirit of a dog animates the physical body of the dog until it makes its transition, then the spirit leaves and the body decays. Um, spirit that animates the tree or animates, you know, plant life until the plant dies, the tree dies, and the spirit separates. Just like your spirit animates your physical body, the asunsum or spirit that animates the earth, mother, ocean, rivers, atmosphere, thunder, lightning, black substance of space, uh, the various planets, sun, moon, stars, and so forth. These are the abosom. The abosom, the orisha, the vodou, the ntoru, ntorutu, these are spirits that animate creation. They are not human beings. They never were human beings. There's a difference between the function of a human being in creation the function of an animal in creation, the function of plant life in creation, 
the function of mineral life in creation, the function, the abosom, the deities in creation. We all have our own function. And when you know who you are, because you're in tune with your culture, in tune with your cry, your soul, your divine consciousness, you know that you have a specific function that was coded in you by the Supreme Being. As a human being, specifically Afurakani and Afurakaiki human beings, we have a specific function as human beings, and then individually we have our own individual function as well. The same with plant life, animal life, and mineral life. We, are, we don't grow into being gods and goddesses. That's silly. That's for people who have a low sense of self-worth because they don't know who they are. They want to be somebody. They want to be something. They just want to call themselves gods and goddesses and say we are the gods and we are growing spiritually to become the god. That's all because when somebody's enslaved and they feel powerless and they feel inadequate and they're insecure, they want to say something that make, makes themselves feel good. They don't have a proper understanding of the term God, where it comes from. We detail that in one of our books, in the Anidapho book. They have a false notion of what a deity is, and then they take that false notion and, and try to apply it to themselves because they feel weak and inferior as a human being because the whites and their offspring taught them that they are inferior. They taught them that they're inferior because we're black, inferior because they're a human being. And they want to be something superior, so they talk themselves into that they're a god or a god which is just silly. That's part of the pathology that we've inherited from the whites and their offspring since living amongst, amongst them. And some of our people continue to talk that nonsense. So, but the, in reality, there's a difference with regards to the class of entities called the forces of nature, the abosome, and us. Now, the whites and their offspring attempted to force Asurakano Asurakai into the false belief that whites had a special relationship with God by creating a fictional son for God and claiming that this fictional white character was the savior of the world. They attempted to make Afurakanu Afurakaitnu believe that our happiness and well-being in life and after death is absolutely dependent on, on us believing in and worshiping the fictional white character. The whites desire to identify themselves with God through their fictional character and therefore force Afurakanu Afurakaitnu into the false belief that the whites and their offspring are divine or have God's blessing no matter what they have done to Afurakanu Afuraikaitu. The whites attempted to control every aspect of the lives of Afurakanu Afuraikaitu through introducing this fictional character that teaches we should love all of our neighbors. These disordered fictional teachings they attach to their fictional character are designed to make Afurakanu Afuraikaitu accept the invasion destruction, abuse, and control from whites and their offspring and view our suffering and their control as divinely ordered from God. They gave the name Jesus, Yeshua, or Jesus to this fictional white character. And then, of course, the brainwashed blacks start, started trying to blacken up this fictional white character to make themselves feel good and began to run with that. So Jesus never existed. The proper etymology of the name Jesus is not Yusu, the ever-coming son coming from misinformation by Gerald Massey. There's actually a divinity named Kainsu. Sometimes this title Kainsu can be applied to Heru, son of Osar, and Aset as well. But there's a separate deity called Kainsu. So in the text here, we talk about specifically the construction of the name Kensu. Chase means child, and Su means divine, royal, king, king of southern Kemet. And Su is the king of southern Kemet, and that's the root. When you look at the, the hieroglyphic symbol for Su, or in Su, it is um, that sedge plant, the plant of the south, representing the south, it's the root, the root plant. And our kings, queen mothers, our ancestry comes from the south. The representation of the south is that the Nekeh plant often, you know, referenced as Insu. Um, and then you have the plant of the north, which is the, uh, the lily, um, the watch plant. So you have the representation of the north. When, you, when the king is called Insu, 
Bati, um, the southern, the king of the south and the north. The Ainsu plant is the Neker plant, which is the root from the south. And then the Watch plant is the, you know, um, the plant of the north. So when you see those two, you see that the south or the southern plant, that is the, the predominant plant because we come from the south. The white crown is the crown of the sovereign. The red crown comes later and connects with the white crown. But the white crown is the crown of the sovereign. It's the crown of the south, and this is where we come from. We get our ancestry from the south, even not just southern Kemet, but also in Kanat Nubia. So this is why the king itself, himself, when you're talking about royalty and sovereignty, the tenth term in Su with that plant comes from the south. Of course, in our Khan culture, Su means our essential nature, our root, our root essence comes directly from in Su in ancient Kemet dealing with that plant. It also has to do with um, third um, dependent pronoun dealing with he or she, representing our essential nature as a male or a female. So, she means child, and su means royal, divine, king, and king of southern Kemet. Shen su is the divine royal child. Now, here we talk about for tens of thousands of years, Afura Kanu, Afura Kaitnut have communicated with the god Heru and invoked his spirit under his title, Shen su, as well as Heru, son of Altar and Alset. The title of Heru was corrupted by the whites from Kensu to Kensus, Kenshua, and Jesus, and applied to their fictional white character. So this is a title, but there are two separate divinities. There's Heru, the son of Alsar and Aset, which is Heru, Sa, Alsar, Sa, Aset. He's also called Heru, Nech, Atep, F, or Heru, the avenger of his father. He has a number of different titles. One of his titles can be Shen Su, dealing with the divine royal child. But there's also a deity named Shen Su Neferhetep Heru. And if you look at both of those deities side by side, you see they're both hawk divinities, hawk-headed divinities. They look identical. If you see images of them, you couldn't tell the difference between um, them except for their headdress. So if you look on page 51, we show images of Shen Su in human form, but also Shen Su with the body of a man and the head of a hawk. Then up under that, we show images of Alsar, Aset, and Heru. Now, if you look at Heru, body of a man, head of a hawk, and then you look at Shen Su right above him, body of a man, head of a hawk, they are identical except for their headdress. Heru, the son of Alsar and Alset, wears the red and the white crown, the united crown. Shen Su Heru, his full name, Shen Su Nefer Hetep Heru, he wears the lunar disc, typically. So, crescent moon and lunar disc. If you didn't look at the headdress and looked at the entity itself, the body of a man, head of a hawk, they are identical. What distinguishes them in the iconography is the headdress. And when you see the hawk-headed deity, with the um, crescent moon, then you know, oh, that Heru is Shen Su Heru. When you look at Heru with the red and white crown, you say, okay, that Heru divinity, that is Heru, son of Alsar, and son of Alset, typically. Even though Heru Behudet, which is another Heru divinity, sometimes he'll wear the red and white, right, white crown as well. So we show these to show that these are two different divinities, and we're going to get into the differences between them. But you need to see that up front. The key is that this particular form of Heru, Kensu, Neferhetep Heru, that Kensu, the divine royal child, is the son of Amen and Mut. Amen is the great father, the supreme being, the hidden one. Amen means hidden or concealed, also means permanent, stable, abiding. Amen, the great father. Then there's a great mother goddess named Mut. Mut means mother. In fact, Mut-er or Mat-er became Mot-er or mother in English and, of course, Latin and so forth. But the root Mut is a term for mother in Kemet. And the great mother Mut is one of the wives of Amen. So Amen, Mut, and Shensu is a triad, just like this, Asar, Aset, and Heru which are a triad. 
Amen, the great hidden father, supreme being. Then you have the great mother, and she gives birth to Shane Sue. The same idea when you deal with um, the quote-unquote savior child, the divine royal child, Shane Sue, whose father is the great God who is hidden, but then you can see his mother, the Theotokos, the great mother and so forth, that's Mut and Shane Sue, the mother and the child, the divine royal child. So, and we also show the Medutu for the name Shane Sue. You see the little root, you see the dark circle, which is the chef or chef sound, which is also used in the um, spelling for the child, chef or chi, and then in su. And then you see a little um, determinative symbol of the seated deity with the crescent moon on its head, indicating that this term, shen su, is talking about a deity and not a male individual or, or person. And then we show how shen su or chen su, jen su, jen su, yeshua, and so forth, becomes, um, you know, the Jesus, Yeshua, Yesu, Yesus in Latin and so forth, and, and on and on. So that's the proper etymology, which until we put that information out, um, it was not out. So all these pseudo-scholars putting misinformation about Yesu, the ever-coming son, is the origin of the term Jesus, and these other um, etymologies, We've shown that that's inaccurate. You'll also see that Shen Su in Coptic can also be spelled Shon Su. So instead of the E in the middle, there's an O. That's one of the pronunciations. That's in the Coptic dialect, the late Kemet dialect. Just it's the same reason why you'll see in so-called Hebrew, which is really not a language, but so-called Hebrew, they'll have Yeshua or Yeshu, but then sometimes they'll spell it Yeshua, like Joshua, Yehoshua, and so forth, Yeshua or Yeshua, and they can't tell the difference between how it's spelled because it's a vowel missing. That's because Chen Su is also Chon Su. This is where you get Chen Shua and Ko Shua and so forth. And then you see in Western Syriac, it is Isho, so, which is Ishu or Yen Shu. This is where it all comes from. Okay. So we talked about the origin of the name first. This is a deity. So you, you've seen the image of the deity in comparison to the other Heru deity, seen his name and what his name actually means, divine, royal, child, and so forth. This is where they get the notion of this child, of the supreme being, is the divine, royal child who's born to be king, king of the quote-unquote Jews and all this nonsense. Okay, okay. so... The god Heru is a spirit force in creation whose energy is operating through the core of the earth and the core of the sun. In your body, Heru's energy operates through your cardiovascular system whose major organ is the heart. In your spirit, Heru's energy operates through your will. The divine energy of the great spirit, Ra and Rayat, who is the creator and creatress of the universe, their divine living energy moving throughout the universe, flows throughout all things in creation, all natural things in creation. The god Heru is a spirit force in creation who regulates the flow of this divine energy so that all things in creation that are natural can receive their share of the, this energy of Ra and Rayat and use it to execute their functions in the world. Heru executes this, executes this function as he operates through your heart and cardiovascular system regulating the flow of blood from the heart to all cells in the body so that all cells can receive the energy, the energy they need to execute their functions in the body. Heru executes the same function as he operates through your will, regulating your energy, your actions, towards various behaviors that allow you to execute your function in the world. Heru executes the same function as he operates through the core of the sun, regulating the flow of solar energy from the sun to the planets of the solar system so that the planets can receive the energy they need to execute their functions in the solar system. Heru executes the same function as he operates through the solar energy at the core of Earth, regulating the flow of energy from the core 
towards the surface of Earth so that the water, sky, plants, animals, minerals, and humans, meaning Aturakani, Aturakaiti humans, can receive this energy and use it to execute their functions in nature. Heru is thus the fourth in creation that takes the energy of the great spirit, Ra, Ra'e, and regulates its flow to us all. Heru is at the heart or core of all things, including animals, plants, planets, stars. The knowledge of this God, this powerful spirit in nature, was corrupted by the whites and applied to their fictional white character, Jesus, who they made to be a white male, God's only begotten son, who is directly related to white people and teaches us to love whites, our enemies, as we love ourselves. And of course, brainwashed Negroes will try to blacken up the, look, the white character, they'll blacken up the white statues, make them black, and say Jesus was black. So the key here is, the takeaway here is, Heru is a force in creation right now operating through the core of the sun, the energy, the spiritual force operating through the core of the sun, the core of the earth, within the Afurakani Afurakani body, and only Afurakani Afurakani people, the spiritual force operating through the heart, uh, regulating the flow of blood, just like the heart regulates the flow of blood. Blood carries energy, but it has to be pumped and sent. How does the energy get to all the cells of your body? It's, the energy is carried in the blood, but the blood has to be pumped, but it has to be regulated. Its flow has to be regulated on a regular basis, and the heart, through its palpitations, regulates the flow of blood to the various parts of the body. If you're in a negative situation or a high tense situation, a fight or flight and so forth, then your heart begins to pump faster because you need more blood, because you need more energy so you can fight or you can run. So the heart is regulating the flow of energy, flow of blood, and therefore the flow of energy to the different parts of the body, the organs, organ systems, and cells that need it. It can determine who needs what and regulate that flow. The energy itself comes from Ra and Ra to create or create stress, but it needs to be regulated when it's moving through the body. In the core of the earth, the core of the earth through its, you know, the revolution of the earth, the um, expansion and contraction of the core, it regulates the flow of energy from the core, that fiery core, to the surface of the earth. The core of the sun regulates the flow of energy from the core outwards, and then the sun regulates energy and sends out energy to the planets, solar system, and so forth. Heru is the spirit force that animates the core of the sun, animates the core of earth, animates the spiritual heart within the Afurakani Afurakani person, as well as the physical heart, is the shrine of Heru. So, um, now you know this is a force in creation, and we're talking about different levels of creation, whether it's in the solar, on the solar level, planetary level, in the physical body, and in the spiritual aspect of the spiritual heart, Heru is operating through all these levels, and he has the same function, regulating the flow of divine energy um, from the core to the surface. So this is a deity. It's not a human being. Now, the root of the name Heru is Ted. Ted, as well as Hedi, in the language of Kemet, means king, chief, he who is above, or leader. When you see the Medus or the hieroglyph, you'll see the head above the um, symbol for the sky. And you see that face in the sky. It's a head or a face. The head up in the sky is the leader, the one on the top, the face in the sky, the, the great divine divinity in the sky looking over everything. And you see the actual head with the ears sticking out, face forward, head or heady. It means he who is above, chief, king, leader. This is one of the reasons why Heru has the title Heri, or king. Her means the, he who is above, and chief, leader, the face in the sky, and Heri is descriptive of that. So the sun also has the title as, as it is the Heri, or the king of the solar system. Your heart is the Heri, or the king of in your body. Um, hold on one second. Got to scroll back down. 
Your will is your heady. It is the king of your action. The core of the earth is the heady or the king of the planet. Your heart, your will, the core of the earth, the core of the sun are also hidden from view. And the divine energy they regulate is invisible or hidden. You don't see the source of what makes the heart beat, but it's, it's beating all t- at all times, whether you're sleeping or whatever. But there's an invisible force that's regulating its palpitation. The core of the sun is hidden. The core of the earth is hidden. Your will, with, which regulates your action, regulates your emotions, your emotional energy output, it's also hidden. The term seshta in the language of Kemet means that which is hidden, secret, or sacred. This is why Heru also has the title Heri Seshta, which means king or chief, Heri, of that which is hidden, secret, or sacred, Seshta. This title, Heri Seshta, was also given to some priests and priestesses in Kemet. The one who is the chief or king, Heri, ruler over that which is hidden or sacred, Seshta, the sacred teachings, the sacred ritual practices, and so forth that appear to be hidden or only accessible to those who are mature, those who are spiritually mature. Just like Hedi Seshta is the king or chief or owner of the Seshta, the hidden secrets, quote-unquote mysteries and so forth, as a title of a priest or priestess, one who has access to the forces of creation, who can attune to the forces of creation, the divine power, that exact same um, notion is the title of a priest in the Yoruba tradition, for example. They are the Baba Lao. Awo means that which is sacred, hidden, or mystery, and Baba is the father, the leader, and so forth. So the Baba Lao is the father who is the owner, Baba, father, Lao or Niawo, Baba Niawo or Baba Lao is the father who is the owner of the Awo, the mystery. That's the exact same function and title of the Hedi Seshta, which is the king or chief Hedi of the Seshta, that which is hidden, secret, or sacred, the mysteries, and so forth. Talking about our capacity to attune to the forces in nature, be possessed by the forces in nature. When you're mature, meaning you align your thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order, then you can access the power of the forces in nature. If you are immature and make yourself repulsive because you're engaged in disorder, then you're repulsive to the apple zone. It's like a magnet repulsing the other magnet across the table when the same polarities are facing. But when you align yourself through maturity, spiritual maturity, to your, your divine function and creation, to the divinity that dwells within your head region, then you're also open to receive the energy and direction from the various abosom, the Orisha, the Vodou, and so forth. So, Hedi Seshta is a title, not only of priests and priestesses, but also with regard to Heru. This title, Hedi Seshta, was corrupted by the whites from Hedi Seshta to Hedi Seshtos, Hedi Shtos, Hedi Stos, and Christ or Christ. This is where they get that from. It's a corruption. And when you look at the etymologies, they'll, they'll go to um, a proto-Indo-European root, and they'll talk about rubbing or anointing and so forth, dealing with Christ or Christma and so forth, the crane, talking about rubbing or anointing the head and so forth, but they don't know why it means that. Where does it come from? It's not a proto-Indo-European root. That Kheri, when they talk about Kheri, talking about to rub or to anoint the head, but then they also talk about Christus Rex and Christ meaning king and the leader and so forth. Why does it mean that? Why does Christ mean king or leader as well as the one that rubs or anoints or was anointed on the head to be a, a leader and the Messiah, Savior, and all that other stuff? Because Kheri means chief, he who is above. The actual Medu is a head in the sky. So Kheri becomes Kheri, and Kheristos, this is where Kheristos, or Christ, comes from. This is the king, chief, leader, Kheri, the head, Kheri. And when you talk about the Kheri Seshta and their ritual practices, dealing with the head of the individual, 
the deity dwells within the head. Your ka, your kaet, is in the head region. Everything that you're supposed to execute in creation is encoded within your ka, which is the deity that dwells in the head region. So when they're talking about rubbing or anointing oil on the head, talking about this is, you know, an initiation into a certain kind of activity as a leader, ruler, savior, all this other stuff comes directly from the heti, which becomes corrupted into heris and heris shistos, keristos in Christ. This is where you get the term from. Function in ancient Kemet for a priest or priestess, but also a title of heteru, specifically when he's assisting the resurrection of Osar, he's in that priestly function, resurrecting his father, giving his father his eye, and he gives his father the eye of Heru that resurrects Osar. Now, one thing that's key here, we don't mention it in this particular text, but what's key, there's another term, so this is the actual origin of the term um, Christ, or Keristos, or Keristos, or Keristos, Keristos, Um Many people will talk about the term karast or keres is the term for Christ. And they see that in the Medutu. They got that again from Gerald Massey. It means to, it talks about the mummy or to make the mummy or mummification. Kares. And it's often spelled K-R-S. And some people say karas. Some people say keres or karus or whatever. It talks about fashioning the mummy, making the mummy mummification, um, the coffin, all these different things. Individuals will take that term karas or karas and they'll say that's the origin of the term Christ. Then they'll start talking about nonsense like Christ consciousness and the karas is the mummy and all, all this other stuff. Christ has nothing to do with the term karas. Christ or keristos or keristos comes from heri and it is a title of Heru. Karas is not a title of Heru. So we've all already shown that Heru is a divinity, a force in creation, what his function in creation is, how he operates in the core of the sun, the core of the earth, in your heart, in the, you know, regulating your will and so forth, and his function on every level of creation is the same function. We show one of his titles, Kemsu, where they get Jesus, from Yeshu, Yeshua, Yosu, Yeshu, and all of that. So we show a title of Heru being Kemsu. So we got that part straight. Then a title of Heru is Heri Sashtos, and is specifically dealing with a function in creation, one of his titles. That's where it comes from. So these people see the term QRS, so KRS, Karas, and they say, well, that must mean Christ. This is where Gerald Massey gets that from, not understanding cosmology, and then runs with it, and our people repeat that nonsense. Karas is talking about making the mummy, and then the karas is the mummy itself. Now, what does that have to do with Christ the King, Savior, and so forth? It has nothing to do with that. Karas is the root of the term karas, or crust, in European languages. Also, karas meaning karas, all, or crystal, in European languages. They'll trace it back to a Proto-Indo-European root and they can't go back any further. But the karast is the origin of the word. The karast in ancient Kemet or Kares is the origin of the word crust and crystal, not crust. The mummy, to make the mummy, when they talk about karast in the Proto-Indo-European languages and they talk about it means to, something to become hard, including something to become frozen, and this is where crystal comes from, crust, oil, or crystal, something hard, frozen, and so forth. And that's what it is. But they don't know why it means that, because it's a word that comes from a language that has nothing to do with them. The karast, the mummy, yes, why do we, why do we mummify? When somebody makes their transition, remove the organs, except for the heart, um, remove, of course, the, the fluid from the body and so forth, then we mummify the individual, then we wrap them up, and they become, quote-unquote, hardened. And thousands of years later, when somebody opens up those bandages, it is preserved so well that it's as if the person was just mummified 
you know, a week ago, and they've been mummified for thousands of years because we had that kind of process to um, preserve the body, to cross the body or make it a karas, make it a mummy, harden it and make it real. Why do we do that? What does karas really mean? When we do that, what is the reason for mummification? The whites and their offspring did not have mummification until they came in contact with our people. So they don't know what it means. So the term karas, to harden, to, you know, um, become hardened or frozen or whatever, yes, the dead body becomes hardened. It also becomes, quote, unquote, frozen. And the whites and their offspring, that's the only um, association they could have with the dead body becoming a crust, like the crust of the earth becoming hard, becoming frozen, they were living in the ice and so forth. So when the dead body, you know, died, it became frozen and hard. So this is where they get crust from. But also, that's the root of the term cut earth or curse, curse. So for them, that dead body, death, and the body itself and the flesh, when they talk about the flesh is evil, that's in the West, pseudo-religion, in the East, with Hinduism and so forth, which is the same pseudo-religion that just have different terms, but it's the exact same false religion, and they have Krishna and everything else, they talk about, you know, extinguishing your desire, staying away from the flesh, you want to liberate yourself from the cycle of reincarnation, the flesh is evil, the world is evil, all the world is suffering, all of that nonsense trying to get away from the flesh in the East, get away from reincarnation, get away from the world, because being in the body the body itself is a, you know, um, a tomb. The body itself is cursed, so to speak. And then you have in the West, they say the exact same thing. They say the flesh is weak, the flesh is evil. You want to get away from the flesh, the flesh, the flesh. It's, it's cursed, it's evil. And it leads you to lust and everything else. That's their flesh, because their flesh is perverse. Their flesh is melanin recessive. It's, it is cursed, so to speak. Our flesh is divine. The blackness with us, in us is divine. We're not trying to escape the physical world because the physical world is the sanctuary of the divinity. So we're sent into the world to live in harmony with the forces in nature, the divine in nature. So we love the world because it's sacred to us. The whites and their offspring despise the world because they're not part of the natural world. They're a corruption. They're a cancerous cell that developed became disfigured in the world, so they're in constant conflict with the world. So therefore, when they look at the flesh while they're alive, that the flesh is evil. And they're constantly trying, from teaching children all the way up to adults, trying to teach young children that your flesh is evil, and it's the root of all your lust, and you need to try to overcome the flesh. And then when the person dies and the body becomes frozen or hard, the whites and their offspring what they used to do is they would cremate the body. They wanted to burn the body up. They didn't want to preserve the body. They wanted to get rid of that evil body. They wanted to put it, set it on fire, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, all you have is ashes. Our people preserved the body. They saw the preservation of the evil flesh, the incrustation or the harden of the evil flesh, quote, unquote. They saw that as a curse. Death in and of itself is a curse. So when you say karas, meaning the death, the mummy, the coffin, the sarcophagus, they see the crust or the hardening of the flesh to make it preserve it forever. They saw that as a curse as well. So all of that to them is evil. But for us, the karas, it's not a curse. We crystallize the body. Why do we crystallize the body? Why do we karas the body? Because when we preserved it, then the physical body becomes the greatest ancestral shrine for that individual so that the people can come to the cemetery, come to the burial ground, pour libation and so forth, and the body, because it's preserved, is a great magnet for that ancestral spirit. So during ancestral observances on a periodic basis, go to the shrine of the deceased where their physical body has been crystallized or become a karas, karas, and then that spirit comes, and we can communicate. The spirit will possess people, communicate with people, teach, guide, heal, and so forth. We did that in ancient Kemet. We do that all the way up to today. Just decades ago, your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents will tell you 
that prior to us having great cemeteries and everything else, living in the South and so forth, when somebody made their transition, we would bury the person under the floor of the house. Your grandmother, grandfather who made their transition, we would bury them, the houses, the floors, we had dirt floors and so forth, we would bury the person under the floor of the house. So when we pour libation, we continue that practice. And we even, though we're brainwashed, some of our people still continue that practice. Somebody makes their transition, we set out a plate of food for them, don't know why we're doing it, but this is part of an ancient tradition. We pour libation even when somebody engaged in nonsense and they pour liquor on the curb saying this is for the brothers who are no longer here and they give them a little drink before they drink some alcohol. They're still doing the same thing we've been doing for hundreds of thousands of years, still trying to communicate with that ancestral spirit. So, but just like, you know, in our past here, we would bury the person under the house, the floor of the house. So when you pour libation in your house, you're literally pouring libation over the area where your grandmother or grandfather's body is. And that is a magnet for that ancestral spirit. Sometimes we would also create sculptures for them. Nowadays people would take, you know, phot photograph, put sometimes photographs on their ancestral shrine to draw the spirit to that area. In the past we would get sculptures and have them consecrated to that ancestral spirit so that becomes a magnet for the spirit to communicate with during ancestral observances. But the greatest ancestral shrine you can possibly have is the actual physical body of the person that they used to dwell in. So we would crystallize or make encrust that body or crystallize it to preserve it forever so that it becomes a crystal or a shrine that radiates the energy of the person and draws that person to them. That's why we did that. This, this is what the karas is. It has nothing to do with some silly notion of Christhood or Horushood. That's nonsense. So when anybody is talking about that, they have no knowledge whatsoever of the cosmology because they're not engaged in ancestral religion. If you do not practice ancestral religion, you can't understand what's the difference between the Hedi Seshta, the keeper of the secrets, the title of a priest or a priestess, and a specific function on how they access the abosom and get possessed by the abosom, the deities, for the benefit of the community and communicate with them and divine with the deities for the benefit of the community, just like a babalao, as opposed to a karas, which is actually the mummy of the deceased individual, and we simply encrust it or crystallize it so that we can communicate with our ancestors and ancestors. Those are two totally different notions, totally different functions. They have nothing to do with one another and people try to combine the two and say karat means Christ. So anybody you see talking that nonsense, whether they're a doctor, PhD, pseudo-metaphysician, uh, so-called priest or priestess or queen, mother or queen, they have no knowledge of what they're talking about. This is why we must investigate. Where do people get the credentials to call themselves experts on ancestral religion and culture? They're making things up. And most of them are following the whites and their offspring and blackening up false information. The experts on our culture are our direct blood ancestresses and ancestors who you communicate directly with through ritual communication. They are the experts. They have founded the culture. And, of course, some of us were there as well, and we've returned through our blood circle. So you have an ancestral memory of this, of having participated. But your ancestresses and ancestors who are spiritually cultivated, your Nanano Nsamampo, or the Aku, Akutu, as they're called in ancient Kemet, they are the experts. And if anybody teaches you things that doesn't comport with what they say, you reject those Negroes because they don't know what they're talking about. And of course, the whites and their offspring, as our enemies, are going to deliberately lie about their information. So they will perpetuate the foolish notion that Karas means Christ because they know it's inaccurate. And our people, have been following the law. So now we, we've given you who Heru is, where the term Kain Su comes from, what his function in creation is, his title, Kain Su, his title, Heri Seshta, now became corrupted to Heri Shistos, or Heri Shistos, Christus in Christ. And in addition to that, where the term Karas comes from, that people have been propagating for years falsely. Now, that in and of itself shows you who the deity is, his function and creation. 
Now we're going to talk about Al-Sar and the whole notion of Heter being born of a virgin and so forth. Um, so we talk about the entire story of the Son of God being born of a virgin who will grow up to lead the people, be killed, and become resurrected as the Savior of the world, was stolen by the whites from the knowledge of the God Heru, his mother the goddess Aset, his father the god Aser, and his father's brother the god Set. Okay, so let, let me make sure I didn't min, miss anything um, in the chat room before we move forward. Okay, and then... One, one comment, Ojirapo, that sounds like what Sister Kentake was telling us about in Jamaica with regards to uh, burying relatives in the backyard. We still wanted to keep them close. Yes, yeah, so some of us, we would bury them. Same thing, like she said, in Jamaica, which is accurate. Same thing in here. Um, bury them in the house, under the floor of the house. And then also, later on, some people, when they were able to get a backyard, you know, we would have a little cemetery and we would bury our people in our backyard, in the backyard of our home. And then later on, when, you know, people start moving out and going to different areas and relocating the white areas and so forth, there's a notion of having a cemetery far away from where you are. You have to drive long distances to get to cemeteries to bury the deceased. That's a later process. But normally it was either under the floor of the house or in the backyard. Okay. So let us get to the... He's dealing with Asa, Set, Heru, Set, and Nebuchadnezzar. Asa, and by the way, like we say, Heru, one of his titles in Akan is Yao. That's also a title in Kemet. Yao meaning a, one who's a fighter, aggressive, warlike, and so forth. Yao means a fighter, aggressive, warlike, and Akan. Heru, as the one who is above, also in Coptic, Heru becomes Hor or Horu, Horu. In Coptic, the Coptic dialect, Koro becomes Koro, Shoro, Soro, and therefore Soro in Akan, he who is above, the name of the divinity. Soro is also shortened to So in Akan, meaning the same thing. And this is why you have So as in Hebioso in Vodun, the same divinity, the king, thunder and lightning, um, the rule of the world and so forth. And you have Songo or Shongo in the Yoruba tradition, the same divinity. So Shongo in Yoruba, so, Sogbo, or Hevioso in Vodun, and So, or Soro in Akan are the same divinity, and Soro comes from Shoro, Koro, and Heru in ancient Kemet, same divinity. All right, so Osar, he's called Osar or Osir in Akan, he's called Awusi or Asi or Aisi, same divinity. Osar is the god in creation whose spirit operates through the star system of Sa called Orion, through the moon, the black soil substance of earth. In your body, Alsar's energy operates through your pituitary gland. Alsar operates as the masculine aspect of your soul, your ka. Alsar is thus the force dwelling within your spirit that is always rooted in what is in harmony with divine order. Alsar is a god whose spirit has the ability to unify the functions or operations of the various forces in nature the god Al-Sar was thus ordered by the Great Spirit to operate on earth and teach Afura Kanu, Afura Kainu, by example, how to live in harmony with divine order. So the spirit that animates the constellation Sa, called Orion, those stars, the sun is a star, but then there are greater stars with more power. The constellation Sa, or Orion, is one of them. Al-Sar operates through that constellation that's flooding our solar system with energy. His spirit animates that star energy, stellar energy that's flooding our solar system. He also operates through the moon as Osar Ya, meaning Osar operating through the moon, um, through the black soil substance of Earth. The black soil is called Kam. This is why Kamet is the black country, also the black land, but also Kam, Kamu or Kamal, the black people. We're talking about dark brown people with black undertones who are connected to this divinity. This is why their skin tone has a blackish tone because they're dark brown with black undertones, whereas the children of Set and other divinities whose sacred color is red, they're dark brown people with red undertones. So you see the Maasai warriors and other people um, who have a reddish tint. They're dark brown people, but they have a red, red undertone. Those are the Desheru or the Reds. 
Then you have the dark brown people with black undertones who are connected to divinities of that cool energy. They are the Kamal, the black. So not only is the land Kamet and Desher, the black land and the red land, or the black country and the red country, but because of the deity, Althar being shown with black skin, Set being shown with red skin, and their children being the blacks and the reds, we're talking about skin color as well as the color of the land, as well as the color of the skins of the deity. So when fools try to talk about that doesn't mean black land, you're dealing with people who don't understand cosmology at all. When you actually deal with these actually de- these actual deities, invoke them, are possessed by them, communicate with them, you know who they actually are. And you can speak with some, you know, proper information as opposed to misinformation coming from the whites and their offspring. So Altar operating through the black soil substance, operating the physical seat of Altar, Awusi, is the pituitary gland. So the spiritual force that animates the pituitary gland, the pituitary gland is a master gland. It regulates the functions of the various glands, so it has a regulatory function in, in the body. Alsar is the spiritual force that animates the pituitary gland, like the spiritual pituitary gland, because his energy and creation is one that regulates the functions of the other deities as a ruler, just like your pituitary gland through its secretions regulates the functions of other glands. That's what Alsar does in the body. In your spirit, Asar governs the Kra in general, the Ka, the Kaya, the Ka in general of people on the masculine side. Now, your particular Ka may be associated with Asar or different divinity, but on the macro scale, as a leader, as a ruler, just like your Ka, your brain regulates all of the other organs in the body, it's a regulator. And therefore, as a regulator, it is under the dominion of Osar in general. But your particular, your peculiar ka, it may be directly connected to Abedna or Sekhmet or Benna, Heru Behudet, or Akua, which is Nebuchadnezzar, or whoever it is. But the function of the brain in general as a regulator on the uh, male side, Osar governs that regulatory function in creation and therefore in your body as well, the two of Jerry Bland is his physical seat. So these are Asar operating through the stellar, in the planetary, the physical body of the planet, the black substance of space, in the physical body of the person, the pituitary gland, and also um, which is connected to the cause, the spirit, spiritual aspect of the individual. So on every level of creation, Asar operates and he has the same function on every level of creation. He's a spirit animating these different levels of creation. Aset is a goddess who, in creation whose spirit operates in the star system Sapatit, which is called Sirius or Sothis, also through the moon, through the river waters of Earth. In your body, Aset's energy operates through the vagina and uterus structure in the female, the penis and prostate gland of the male. Of course, Aset is the male aspect of that. And then Aset operates as the feminine aspect of your soul, your kaya, so she's just like Osar and Osset work together as regulators. So on the macro level, since your brain and your pituitary gland regulate the functions in the body, Osar and Osset govern that regulatory function, but your individual peculiar ka may be connected to um, different divinity, a different divinity. So that's why we say she uh, operates as the feminine aspect of the kaya as a regulator. Aset is thus the force dwelling within your spirit that makes you receptive to what is in harmony with divine order. Aset is the goddess whose spirit has the ability to maintain the unity of functions and operations of the various forces in nature. The goddess Aset was thus ordered by the great spirit to operate on earth, to teach Akurakanu, Akuraikaitu, by example, how to maintain their living in harmony with divine law. Aset's energy is able to unify the functions and operations of the various forces in creation. So different things have different functions, but those functions must be unified in order to work. Every part in your car has a specific function. Uh, the engine, transmission, everything has its own specific function. 
If you were to look at each part and say it has this function, it has this function, it has this function, that's all fine. But if their functions are not unified so they work together, meaning they're doing their own thing but also doing their own thing in, interdependently with the others, if their functions are not put together and unified, then the car is not going to work. OSAR, as a regulator, having a regulatory function, has the capacity to unify the functions of the various organs in the great divine body, meaning the various deities in creation. Offset has the capacity to maintain that unity of function. There's one thing for things to be unified and functioning, but it has to be maintained. It's like gravity or magnetism holds things together. It must be able to be maintained. So Offset unifies, Offset maintains that unity. Because they have those regulatory functions in creation where they can unify all the forces in creation, and then maintain the unity of all the forces in creation. Because of that, Ra and Ra'et directs Osar and Osset to operate in creation and teach us, by example, how to live in harmony with divine order. So when they talk about Osar and Osset teaching the people civilization, civilized society, and so forth, meaning we're communicating with these forces in nature, um, getting possessed by these forces in nature, and learning from them when a both song possesses that a ritual, or Orisha possesses that a ritual, or Vodou possesses someone at a ritual, whether they're dancing and they get possessed by the deity, or they're not dancing, they may be engaged in ritual prayer and they get possessed. And the spirit gets inside the body and begins to communicate and teach people as, as well as heal people and admonish people for wrong things and teaching people what the culture is. We're learning directly from the forces in nature. So when they talk about Osar and Osset operating amongst the population, this is what we're dealing with. Because they're not people, they're forces in nature that possess people, that communicate with people, and they still do to this day. Um, Osar, for example, is called Oshala or Orishanla or Babatla or Obatala in the Yoruba tradition, the same divinity, called Awusi in the Akan tradition, Aguisi in the Igbo tradition, Dangbe in the Vodun tradition. Offset is called Ajua in our culture as well as Etsi. She's called Od Odudua, the wife of Obatala in the Yoruba tradition. Um, she's called Minona in the Vodun tradition. She's called Idemili in the Igbo tradition. Same force in nature. Okay, so we showed on every level from Sapati to Star Sirius, the moon, um, earth, river waters of earth the vagina and uterus structure, as well as the um, feminine aspect of the kayak and so forth, on every level of creation, she has the same regulatory function, the spirit force. Now we get to the god Set. The, the brother of Osar and Osset, the god Set is a spirit force in creation whose energy operates through the star system, Mesketi, called the Great Bear, planet Mercury, which we call Awuku and Akan, called Set in ancient Kometa, Sobek, and the deserts or red hot lands of Earth. In your body, that energy operates through the nervous system and the gonads, which are the testes of the male, the ovaries of the female. In your spirit, set energy governs your desire. Desire can be for that which is in harmony with divine law, yet desire can be also misguided, making that which is disharmonious seem attractive. Now, now you have Osar, Oset, Set, and Heru. Now we can get into the story, and then we can show how they function in creation, and where the cracker stole the story from. One thing we need to mention, the title Merit, M-E-R-I-T, as spelled in Coptic, Merit. Merit means love or desire, Merit, um, beloved, desirous, and so forth, the beloved one, and so forth. Offset has the title Merit. She's the beloved one. She's the beloved of Osar. Offset Merit, Osar, the beloved, beloved of Osar. Merit, of course, is where they get married from. So this is the title of Offset, the mother of Heru. She's called Merit. Heru is referred to as Hensu. So this is Mary and Hensu, Mary and Jesus, Mary and Jesus. This is where it comes from. But we're talking about forces in nature. All right. Let me make sure before we get going, we didn't miss anything. All right. Okay, we're going to get through this, and then we're going to take um, 
some of the calls and, and questions and so forth. But we want to get through this section. And here's the narrative, and then we're going to get into it. So the narrative is, in Afuraka, Afuraikai, Africa, the great spirit, meaning Ra and Ra'at, the creator and creatress, directed Yabosom, the god Asa, and Yabosom, the goddess Asa, to operate amongst the population of Afurakanu, Afuraikaitnu, and guide our spirits to living in harmony with divine law and how to maintain the life of harmony. Osar and Oset became king and queen in Afuraka, Afuraikaya. As Afurakanu, Afuraikaitnu, meaning Africans in Kemet and Kenetit, Nubia, lived under the government of the king Osar and the queen Oset, we learned the divine balance of male and female. Osar and Oset instructed us in spiritual cultivation, as well as the cultivation of the land. We began to apply what we learned under the guidance of Osar and Oset, and we built great civilizations around the world reflecting the divine harmony of creation. Our culture is a reflection of the divine balance of male and female, Osar and Oset, in all things. So what we're talking about here, we learn culture from the forces in nature. The forces in nature, just like you have organs in your body that regulate order in your body, the organs within the great divine body of the supreme being in creation are the deity, the spirit that animates the stars, the sun, the black substance of space, the earth, the planets, and everything else. They are the organs within the great divine body of Amen and Aminne, called Nyame, Nyame Wanakan Kosha. The deities are the divine organs. They are the regulators of order. They are the embodiments of divine order and creation. As they move, creation is an orderly creation, of course. The spirits that animate sun, moon, planets, and stars and black substance of space, they are spirits of divine order. If you align with them, you learn what divine order is because you're in the flow of order that they manifest on a consistent basis. Then you can take that understanding of divine order and apply it to your life, apply it when you establish a society, apply it with regard to your personal individual operating in, in the world, your interactions with people you're connected to, but establishing a social order rooted in the divine order of creation, which is what a civilization is. You attune to the forces of divine order, learn order from them, and then replicate that order to create a society. That's why we have societies, civilized societies, civilizations, and the whites and their offspring just have society. They don't have civilized societies. They've never created a civilization because a civilization is a social order rooted in the divine order of creation. You can't have that kind of order unless you can attune to the forces in nature and the whites and their offspring as spirits of disorder do not have the capacity to attune to the forces in nature. They are repelled by the forces in nature, just like a large magnet repels the magnet whose polarity is reversed, and so forth. When we're talking about they become king and queen and commit, again, we're talking about the spirit forces through spirit possession will possess a king. We have a king and queen mother. Offset possesses, just like you can go to a ritual today. And offset, or Essie, as she's called in Coptic, she's called Essie in Akan. That our both some Essie will possess somebody today, and they'll speak through that person and communicate. And now the nation is being literally run by the deities. Why? Because the male and female, king and queen mother, they will possess these abosom. This is how we first began to establish society. People get possessed by the abosom, and they lay out um, the social order. Then generations after that, we, we learn that social order and teach it, and then we have kings and queen mothers who are not constantly possessing the divinities on a regular basis because they've already learned the order. So they will consult with the Abosom when necessary, but they don't have to possess on a regular basis consistently um, day in and day out because we've already learned the order that the Abosom have given us, and we establish it and move with it. Originally, when we want to learn how to establish ourselves in harmony with order, the elders and elders, elders in the community, priests and priestesses who are also priests, kings and priests, queens and so forth, priests, queens, they get possessed by the Abosom. So we want to know how do we function? How should we establish agriculture? How should we do this? How should we do that? Go to the individual who can possess the Abosom. The Abosom comes through them, possesses. The Orisha comes through them, possesses. We ask the information, get the information from them, and then we establish 
what they directed us to establish. Now, the deities are literally the king and queen because they're possessing the physical king and queen to communicate with us. So this is what we're dealing with. Okay, let me scroll back up right quick. Um, all right. So that's what we're talking about. So our, so we said the, our culture is a reflection of the fine balance of male and female, all sorrow and all set and all things. Yet the God set desired to govern and commit himself in place of the God Osar, set therefore plotted and killed Osar, disposed of his body in the river, took over the rule of Kemet, and began a tyrannical, disharmonious government rooted in misguided desire, disorder, lust. After the murder of Osar, the goddess Osset was forced out of her role as queen of Kemet. She searched tirelessly for the body of her husband Osar, that he may be given a proper burial. When she found the body of her husband, Osset performed ritual. She began to invoke the spirit of Osar from his existence in, in the ancestral realm. Through ritual, Osset communicated with her husband and was thus drawn to his spirit. Through their divine spiritual union, Osset became pregnant. Because of, because of her devotion to her husband, Osset was referred to under the title Merit, which means beloved. In the language of Kemet, she is called Merit Osar, the beloved of Osar. The whites corrupted this name Merit into Mary and Miriam and gave it to their fictional white female character. The union of the spirit of the god Osar with the goddess Osset, which resulted in Osset becoming pregnant with her son, the god Kensu Heru, was corrupted by the whites into the immaculate conception and virgin birth by a fictional white character named Mary who would give birth to a fictional white boy, Jesus, or Jesus, whose father was God. The goddess Osset was informed by the god Tehuti that the son she was carrying in her womb would grow to be strong. He would defeat and remove Seth from power and reestablish divine law and order. As divine heir to the throne, the son of the god Osar would restore the divine government of his father. Osset was directed to give birth to her son and raise him away from the seat of power of the government because Set had declared that all male children would be killed. Set knew that the son of Osar was going to be born. He knew that the son of Osar was the rightful heir to the throne, who would challenge the evil government and abolish it. Set was thus sought to kill the child as soon as he was born. However, Osset followed the directions of Tehuti. She gave birth to Kensu Heru and hid away in the swamps of northern Kemet. The whites corrupted this knowledge of the gods and goddess into a prophecy to a fictional white female, Mary, by an angel represented by Tehuti, that she would give birth to the Son of God. The whites made their fictional Mary go into northern Egypt or commit to hide their fictional son, Jesus. This is also one of the reasons why the whites made their fictional Moses to be hidden in the swamps of northern Egypt as a baby. The whites also corrupted the knowledge of the gods set into the fictional account of the evil king, Herod, who decided to put to death all newborn boys so that the savior child would never live to challenge the government. The whites created a fictional character called the devil, who they made into a spirit of absolute evil. Evil. They corrupted the name Set or Seti into Setin or Satan and applied it to their fictional devil. And we're going to go with, finish with the narrative, and then we'll explain um, the details. The god Set eventually found that Heru had been born, he found out where Heru was and had him killed. One of Seth's associates stabbed Heru. And in the Metronic Stele, they talk about the followers of Set as scorpions. They came and stug, stung Heru in the side, stung him, and he, he died. So the scorpion stinger, of course, when they talk about Heru being on the cross, him being stabbed in the side, and he died by one of the associates of Herod, of, you know, and all of that, this is where that comes from. When Alset found that her son Heru had been killed, she went to embrace the deceased body of her son and lamented. Her sister, the goddess Nebethet, also lamented with her. Now, Nebethet is a goddess in nature whose spirit also operates through the star system of Sapatit, which is Sirius, through the planet Venus, and the rainwaters of Earth. In your body, Nebethet operates through your kidneys. In your spirit, Nebethet governs your emotion. As Osset and Nebethet lamented the death of Heru, the goddess Serket 
a scorpion god is told Aset to call on Ra. Aset called on Ra the Creator, and Ra, his boat in the sky, the sun boat stopped. He sent Tahuti down from the boat of the sun. Tahuti came down from quote unquote heaven to cause Heru to be resurrected. The whites corrupted this episode into the two fictional Marys, lamenting the death of the fictional Jesus and learning of his resurrection from an angel of the Lord. Aset has the title Meris, meaning beloved, yet Meris is also a title held by Nebuchadnezzar. So these are two Mary goddesses, the two Marys, the two Meris. For thousands of years, Akurai Kaidut have communicated with these goddesses and invoke Aset and Nebethet under the title Merit. They are also identified with the functions of Merit Shema and Merit Met, meaning Merit of the South and Merit of the North, the two um, female divinities of the inundation of the river, two river goddesses, and sometimes Aset and Nebethet take on the functions of Merit Shema and Merit Met. This is why they're the two Marys. So this is where they stole that from. So every aspect of the story in the Bible about Jesus' character is stolen directly from ancient Kemet, talking about gods and goddesses operating in creation. Now, after Heru's resurrection, there was great rejoicing because Aset saw in him one who would answer for his father. Heru, along with another warrior god called Heru Behudet, the son of Ra, this is Heru Ur, the great Heru, Heru of Enfu, and so forth, <clears throat> led a great army to victory over Set, removing Set from government. Heru then assumed his rightful place as the ruler of the world. The whites corrupted this episode by applying these acts to their fictional character, Jesus, claiming that he would overcome Satan with an army of angels and become ruler of the world. Heru and Heru Behudet, which is actually Yao and Binna in Akan culture, Shango and Ogun in the Yoruba tradition, um, Aro and Ikenga in the Igbo tradition, Hebioso and Ogu in the Vodou tradition. Heru and Heru Behudet fighting set together was applied to the fictional Messiah and Mahdi of the whites who come to destroy the rule of Satan. Now, Heru with the goddesses are set and Nebuchadnezzar his mother and his aunt performed a ritual to resurrect the god Osar. Osar was thus resurrected, and his spirit left the ancestor realm to rejoin with the great spirit Ra and Ra'et to operate as a god in nature. This knowledge of Heru or Hensu, along with Aset and Nebuchadnezzar resurrecting Osar, was also corrupted by the whites. The name Osar was preserved perverted into Osiris by the whites. The ancient title Ur, the U-R, Ur with the rolling R, meaning great or the great, in the language of Kemet, was corrupted by the whites into Ul, U-L. There was no letter R, L, L in ancient Kemet. There was a rolling R. So Ur is translated as Ul in European languages like Greek and so forth. Just like in Akan, there's no letter L in the Akan language. There's a rolling R. So you have, for example, the foreign word, mulato. Akan people will say murato, murato, murato ni, because we don't have an L, we have a rolling R. Because our language is descended from ancient Kemet, there was no L, there was a rolling R. So if you have, for example, Ptolemy in the Medutu, they would use the hieroglyph or Medut for the letter R, for that foreign name, Patalemi, and it'd be spelled in the Medutu, Pataremi, Pataremi. But the Greeks would say Patalemi, Patalemius. So the ancient title, Ur, U R, Ur, meaning the great, was corrupted into Ur. The god Asar, under the title Ur, Asar, meaning the, the great one, Ur, Asar, Ur Asar was corrupted into Ul Osiris. Ul Osiris becomes Ul Lazarus. Ul Lazarus or Lazarus. Lazarus. The fictional Jesus with two Marys behind him as their brother Lazarus or Lazarus. Ul Lazarus. Ul Osiris. Ul Asar. 
Lazarus is resurrected is a perversion of the knowledge of Heru with Oset or Merit and Nehet or Merit behind him as they resurrect their brother, the god Osar. Lazarus comes out in bandages or mummified because the god Osar was always depicted in the form of a mummified god in Kemet. So again, this whole story is totally lifted from the story of Osar, Oset, and Heru down to a specific detail. In northern Kemet, a major city called Dada, also Jedjedu or Jedda, Jedda, was sacred to Osar, Oset, and Heru. In this city, they were often referred to under the names Ba, Nebdada, Hat Mehit, and Heru Pakar. Osar, the father, was identified and referred to as Ba Nebdada, meaning the ram, Ba, Neb, Lord, Dada, the city of Dada. Um, so he's Ba Neb Dada. He's associated with that deity. There's a deity called Ba Neb Dada. Osar was associated later on with Ba Neb Dada. Um, so Ba Neb Dada came to be pronounced Ba Neb Dada. Ba Neb Dada, the whites corrupted into the title Banedara, and they corrupted that into Panatara and Bandira. Osar was thus referred to as Pandira instead of Banedara, Banedara, Bandira, Pandira. He was referred to as Pandira, and his son Heru was called Heru, the son of Pandira. Heru, or Hensu, the son of Pandira, was a title stolen by the whites and used for their fictional character who never existed called Jesus, or Yeshua ben Pandera, meaning Jesus, son of Pandera, son of Pandera. This is where you get Yeshua or Yehoshua Pandera in the Talmud. has nothing to do with the character that actually existed. There was no uh, historical Jesus in the Talmud that Negroes like to believe. Some Negroes just want to believe in Jesus. And they call themselves Afrocentric, but they, they're like, well, there was a historical Jesus. He was Jesus ben Panther, Jesus ben Pandera, Yeshua ben Pandera. That's the historical Jesus, and the other Jesus was not historical. Yeshua ben Pandera, or Kensu ben Pandera, Kensu, the son of Pandera, is Kensu, or Heru, the son of Pandera, or Banedera, Banedera, Banedara, Banedara, and so forth. Ba means ram, and the symbol is a ram. Neb means master, lord, and so forth. Dada is the, the region, the city, but it has a meaning as well. So Banedada, the great ram, Ba, lord of Dada, Banedada, which became corrupted into Pandara or Pandera. What's key, however, is the term Ba, as well as the long form Basa, but the word Ba actually means not only ram, but it's also the word for panther in ancient Kemet, including the leopard. The panther deity is Ba. So Banedara also means the panther, the master of Dara. So Banedara is also Pandera, the panther. And then Heru or Hensu, the son of Pandera, or Banedara is the son of the panther. This is where Jesus or Yeshua ben Panther comes from. Again, because we do not scrutinize, we'll listen to Dr. Finch repeating what Gerald Massey said about Jesus Ben Panther and saying, well, this, this was just a family name. Absolutely not. There's a Panther deity we call Ba, and this is where it comes from. So you must understand when we scrutinize, you'll find out that the truth is actually in the text. Now, um, so th that's that whole narrative from the virgin birth, the young child, growing up, you know, having to be forced into northern Kemet and hiding, um, growing up to be the savior of the world, the evil king ruling, um, trying to kill all the young baby boys so the, you know, um, the savior child wouldn't be born. Eventually the savior child grows up, um, wages war against Set and so forth. All, all the different things becomes ruler of the world and reestablishes divine order, becomes a savior. Entire story comes directly from Kemet. Now, we talk about Osar and Oset when they operate through the people. It's like you have people who are in, in the Yoruba tradition. She's a child of Obatala. He's a child of, you know, Shango. She's a child of 
um, you know, Yemoja or whoever. Same thing in the Akan tradition and every tradition across the board. And so this is what we're talking about when the deities are operating amongst the people. We had we spent more time invoking them in the beginning when we wanted to establish society. Nowadays, we once you get the society established, so for example, an Abosom possesses someone for the first time. Think about the first time somebody was ever possessed by an Abosom. That was a new condition. So once they're possessed and the Spirit is speaking to people and healing people, then we remember what the Abosom says, and then we put those things into practice every day, and we reestablish our society based on what the Abosom said when they possessed, because they also, they're also watching and communicating and directing us as well. And then on ritual days, are established certain days over the course of a number of weeks set aside to worship and communicate with this specific divinity, and they possess during those rituals and so forth and, and continue and replenish the culture. In the beginning, when the deities first began to possess, we would communicate with them more often, more frequently, to get everything we need to know in place. And once we learn what we need to know, then we establish civilization and we live that civilization. And then we will communicate with them periodically as opposed to possession every day trying to get this information. And once they laid it out and we established a civilization, then we live that civilization. And when people who established those first civilizations and founded those first civilizations based on what the deities directed us to do, they became ancestresses and ancestors when they died, and then they will continue to guide us as honored ancestresses and ancestors to keep the civilization going. So we will possess and communicate with them more often as well. And the pr process continues. Um, before we go forward, there's uh, about two minutes left in the broadcast. If you want to stay on beyond 2 o'clock, um, you have to call in because on the Internet, um, you know, the broadcast will stop. But if you're on the phone, you can continue to listen. And we probably have like 20 minutes or a half an hour to go um, of more material. So the number is 657 383 Six five seven three eight three zero six three five. You can call in now. You've got a little bit less than two minutes so that you can listen past um, two o'clock. You got a minute and forty five seconds. Six five seven three eight three zero six three five. Call now to get on the line so you can continue. All right. So let's get back to that. All right. Just like with Osar and Aset, same thing with Set, Nebethet, the various Abosom, communicate with these various Abosom. These are forces in nature that possess us and direct us. Set is also called Sut in ancient Kemet. This is where you get in the Yoruba tradition, Esu, the, the trickster, the communicator, and so forth. The sacred color is red and black. He operates through the planet Mercury. In our ancient Kemet, Set's colors are red as well as red and black. He's the trickster, also operates through the planet Mercury. Um, and operate through the desert. In our Khan culture, Anansi, his sacred colors, red and black. He's also operating through the owner of the desert, also the trickster, also the communicator, also operates through the planet Mercury. This is why he's called Kwaku Anansi. Same divinity, same functions in creation across the board. He's a communicator, so, but also, quote, unquote, trickster. Um, so this is what we're dealing with. The reason why the story, the quote-unquote human story, is compelling here and why people get things mixed up is because, number one, the whites in our offspring tried to make us believe that the deities didn't exist because they were trying to destroy our ancestral religion. They couldn't have us communicating with forces in nature once they invaded our society because if somebody invades your society, they've been invading for thousands of years, we were destroying them militarily for thousands of years. They finally gained a foothold in northern Kemet, the Greek invasions after, prior to that, Persian and so forth. Um, the Greeks come in and invade, get the Persians out, and the Greeks stay in northern Kemet. They can't have people who they're trying to control and rule just be able to go into their houses, sit in front of an idol. The spirit speaks to them through the idol, and people rise up and go kill, you know, the enemy. They have to make us believe that the deities ordained for them to come in and take over the 
culture. So they had to corrupt the religion. This is the origin of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, and so forth. Corrupting the religion to make us believe, first, that the deities are not real, the deities never existed. At first they started making them white, but then they began to say they never existed. Then start trying to make people believe that actually the deities, these spirits you're communicating with, they were really just deified ancestors or people who became adepts and were honored and later honored as deities, totally inaccurate. And you have brainwashed Negroes today who call themselves priests, priestesses, linguists, scholars, Afrocentric and, you know, metaphysicians and elders and eldresses walking around trying to tell you that Osar, Oset, and Heru were either just principles and were just anthropomorphized aspects of Ashe or spiritual energy, or meaning we manufactured these stories, or that they were just deified ancestresses and ancestors who later on became honored, and because they were honored for so long, they became like deities. Totally inaccurate. There's a difference between a deified ancestor, which is the Aku, the Akutu, the Nanano Nsamanfo in our Khan culture, as opposed to the regular Nsamanfo. There are different classes of ancestral spirits. Some who are just regular people who died, who were nice people, who weren't necessarily spiritually cultivated. And then you have the Nanano Nsamanfo, the ones who fulfilled their function in creation, lived in harmony with divine order, and therefore are given increased power or tumi by Nyame Wa Nyame, Amen, Amen, the Supreme Being to assist us in our development, assist us with healing, birthing, medicine, these different things they possess, they communicate, and so forth, they're on a higher level because they live in harmony with divine order. That increased power and responsibility they're endowed with by the Supreme Being. Those become deified, quote-unquote, deified ancestresses and ancestors because they function similar to the divinity. But they are still in the class of Nsamanfo. They're just Nanano Nsamanfo, as opposed to regular Nsamanfo. They are Nana, Nanano plural, Nsamanfo. But that's still a class of human beings which is totally different than Abosom. So there's, there's a total difference between a deified ancestor or ancestress and an Abosom, or an Orisha, or a Vodou. So the deities are, are not deified ancestresses and ancestors. Anybody who tells you that or teaches that, you know for certain they have no knowledge whatsoever of the culture at all. They're not invoking anything, because if they were, then the Abosom would direct them to reality. And the only people who teach that nonsense are people who've been influenced by the White's Narrow Spring. Typically people who've been studying the White's Narrow Spring work, or if they were influenced by Muslims and Christians on the continent, over the past couple of centuries, and then they began incorporating that nonsense into the culture, always under the influence of the white and offspring. Deities are deities. Human beings are human beings, whether the human beings are alive or they made their transition. There is a clear distinction between the two classes. So, but the reason why these stories are compelling, and specifically this story is compelling, and you can feel a deep connection with you know, the story of an evil king and killing his brother and taking over and trying to stop the son from even being born. If the son is born, they find out the son is born trying to kill the son because they don't want him to take over. Of course, they stole the whole story of the Lion King from this story. Everybody's seen that. But this whole notion, the reason why we can feel it is not because Osar and Oset and Set and, and Nebuchadnezzar and Heru were just walking around as people and then they died later. There are people, just like us today, who these are both some govern their head. So you have a king who his head are both some his awusi, his asa. You have a queen mother who, whose head are both some his ajua. Or you have a brother who's a both some, who's kratin both some his awuku or set. Or you have another sister who's a both some his awuku or akua or nebethet also called Akberu in the Yoruba tradition. So you have people who are governed by these divinities, but they're still human beings, so they make mistakes. And they get involved in foolish behavior and jealousy and envy and lust. And this story, yes, it did happen in commit with people, just like it's happened 
all over Afraikai numerous times, even up until today. In the Akan tradition, for example, the reason why some Akwamu people, which is our people, but some of the Akwamu people live in the eastern region, and then some live in the northwestern region of Ghana into Ivory Coast, why did those Akwamu separate when they used to all be together? Because of succession disputes, which will lead to actual warfare where people are killing each other. One people, one group of one group of Akwamu people want one person to be the king, the next king. Another group wants somebody else to be the next king and literally go to war, civil war, to the point where they separate from each other. You have one Akwamu group living in one place for hundreds of years and another Akwamu group living in another place. We talked about it in previous broadcasts because of a succession dispute amongst the Asante Akan people because Asante fell into a civil war. Some people wanted Prempe to be the next Asante Hini or the next king. Another faction wanted um, another elder to be the next king. There was a, a dispute, and it fell into a civil war where people were waging war, killing each other, because we were engrossed in a civil war and slaughtering each other. The whites and their offspring, the British and their allies, attacked from the outside, and they were able to defeat the Asante Empire in that last war and annex them in 1901. Up until that point, the British and their allies had waged war against the Asante Empire numerous times and lost every war. But that last war, because Asante was engrossed in a civil war based on a succession dispute, who was going to be the next king, then, you know, they, they lost the war. This has happened numerous times in our blood circle, so we can feel it because we have ancestresses and ancestors who were killed because of succession disputes. Wars, we're part of ancestral groups right now. We're descended from individuals who, who wage war against one another, internecine warfare, in, interfamily warfare, and we were separated. This story is talking about not only people being guided by Yavosom, but people who are the children of certain Yavosom, the kinds of behaviors they engaged in and what took place. It happened in ancient Kemet, it happened in ancient Kana, it continues to happen today. And we can learn something from the story because we can see what the outcome is. So once we start falling into these patterns, we can correct ourselves because we know what happened. So it wasn't that Osar and Oset and Set and Nebuchadnezzar were walking around. These are deities that the people will communicate with. If they listened to what Osar and Oset said and what Set in the real sense said and Nebuchadnezzar and so forth, they would have lived in harmony. But some people, you know, decide they get the information from the divinity, but they don't want to do what the divinity directs them to do. They don't want to live in harmony with order. They find out what is the correct course of action. What's harmonious? But they don't want to do that because they're lustful. So they're going to do something else. And then that leads to conflict and, and you know, a great conflagration in society. So this is what we're talking about. Okay. So then we get into the section where we start breaking down how the story operates on every level. Stellar, solar, lunar, the earth, the physical body, and within the divisions of the spirit of the person. So you can see the whole story of Asar, Aset, and Heru operating, unfolding in every level of creation. This is something that we put forward um, with regard to this information that nobody published up until the point we put this information out. So not only did we put out the proper etymologies for the names of these divinities and where they came from, for the first time, because there was there were mis, misinformation regarding these etymologies, pseudo etymologies before, but now we give the full detail as far as how the deities operate on every level of creation to show how this story unfolds to prove it's not. Um, there, of course, nothing was happening in Palestine with any Jesus or anything else. So Heru operates at the core of the sun. We talk about the cycles of the sun. Heru's cycles. Um, deal with the whole story. Every year at spring, March 21st, near March 21st, the day consists of about 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of darkness. Every day after that, sunlight increases about a minute or more per year. By June 21st, 15 hours of sunlight, 9 hours of darkness is the longest day of the year. The summer solstice, the sun reaches its highest arc in the sky. After June 21st, 
then the daylight begins to decrease about a minute or more until you get to uh, September 22nd or September 23rd, the fall equinox, equal nights, equinox, 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of darkness. It continues to decrease less and less sunlight. The arc of the, you know, rising and setting of the sun gets lower and lower because of the position of the um, earth with respect to the sun. So you get to December 21st, which we just passed, which was the uh, winter solstice. The soul or the sun is standing still, stiff. It hits the, the lowest arc possible. Longest night, shortest day. 15 hours of darkness, 9 hours of sunlight. Shortest day of the year. And it stays like that for a few days. 15 hours of darkness, 9 hours of of light, that low level, that lowest arc, but then the light begins to increase around either December 24th or December 25th, depending on the year, and about a minute every day, more and more light. A minute longer that, that day, the next day, December 26th, another minute or so longer, December 22nd, the light keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. So you get to uh, March 21st, where there's 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of darkness. Every year after December 21st, the darkest and longest night of the year, and the sun stands still, and by December 25th, the light begins to increase. The sun's light begins to increase. The sun is born every December 25th. Of course, this is where they get that from. So um, this is why we say... The sun begins, to, sun begins to increase on December 25th. When the daylight, the light of the sun, begins to increase on December 25th, our ancestresses and ancestors recognize the birth of a new sun. The sun, which was created by the supreme being, was said to have been born. The supreme being's sun is born every December 25th. This sun is the light of the world. The whites corrupted this knowledge into a fictional account of a white boy called God's son, the light of the world, being born on December 25th. Between December 25th and March 21st, the sunlight is increasing, yet there are still more hours of darkness than there are hours of light. Darkness, or set, rules the world as king. When the daylight increases to the point of equality with darkness on or near March 21st, the powers of light and darkness are equal at 12 hours each. At this time on Earth, the sun can be seen positioned on the intersection of of the Earth's celestial equator and the Earth's ecliptic, which is Earth's pathway around the sun. The celestial equator, is, the Earth has an equator. If you extend the equator out, the plane of the equator out into the solar system, um, on March 21st, the Earth's pathway around the sun, that, that path, that line that goes around the sun, if you were to draw a line of the path of the Earth's path around the sun, that's the ecliptic. When it crosses with the um, celestial equator, the sun can be seen positioned on the cross of the ecliptic and the celestial equator, and it's sitting right on that cross, March 21st. The sun is hanging on the cross. And so this is why we say when the sun is seen to be positioned on the intersection of the equator and the ecliptic, the sun is said to be positioned on a cross. After March 21st, the sunlight increases and darkness begins to decrease. The position of the sun is no longer on the intersection of the equator and the ecliptic. The sun is then said to have overcome its hanging on the cross or death on the cross. By June 21st, the beginning of summer, the sun rises at its highest peak or point in the sky, directly above your head. That's why it's 15 hours of sunlight, 9 hours of dark. It is said that the sun has ascended into heaven to be with the Father. And notice that the sun, the aurea, the sun, is a physical transmitter of the spiritual energy of Ra and Ra'et. Ra is not the sun. Ra'et is not the sun goddess. They created the sun and the various stars. They use the sun as a physical transmitter, just like you use a laser beam to transmit energy the sun is used to transmit life force energy 
it is transmitter of the energy of Ra and Ra'et, but Ra and Ra'et's energy permeates all of creation, including the black substance of space, and illuminates the stars. It is the power behind the various stars. This is why you can see Ra sitting in the boat of the sun. Sometimes the sun is sitting in front of him, and he's sitting next to the sun. Sometimes they will show him sitting inside of the sun, showing he's the power that's in the sun, but he is not the sun. So when the sun rises to its highest point in the sky, the sun has left the cross and ascended to be with the Father in heaven. All right, so this cycle of the sun, Heru's cycles in nature, was corrupted by the whites into a story of a fictional white male who was born on December 25th, struggled with the devil, the prince of darkness, and evil king of the world, was hung on a cross, overcame death, and ascended into the sky or heaven to sit on the right hand of his father. The whole story is played out. We talk about the goddess of Set operating through the star Sirius of Sapate. She's the great provider. That's what the um, Sapate means. That's the term in Kemet, what the term they call Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Um, Sa is the term for the system Orion, which they call the hunter. And you see the three stars in Orion's belt and so forth. It's called Sa in ancient Kemet. And Ostar Osar operates through Sa. In the stellar region, he operates through the constellation Sa, or Orion. Oset operates through Sapatid, or Sirius, as male and female, husband and wife. The energy of the star system Sa, or Orion, and the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, that energy reaches into our solar system and stimulates the energy of our sun, which is, is miniature compared to the star system, the Pasit and um, Orion or Sa. Um, Sapat, we said, means provider, provider. Our set is operating through the star system, Sapa. She's called the Queen of Sapa. The Queen of Sapa became corrupted into the Queen of Saba and later the queen of Shaba, and the queen of Sheba. There was no queen of Sheba. So people who think that the queen of Sheba was black and that makes us, you know, something special, queen of Sheba never existed at all. The queen of Saba, or the queen of Shaba, later Sheba, is all set operating through the star Sapa, or Sapatet. The god of star operates through the star system Sa. He is called Hedi Met, King or Chief Hedi Met of the North. Hedi, as we said in Coptic, becomes Hori, Hor, Hori. Hori became corrupted into Shori, Shori, Sholi, Soli. So Hori Met, Hedi Met becomes Hori Met. That's Coptic, Hori Met. Hori Met, corrupt, pronounced by the whites and their offspring, becomes Shori Met or Sholi Met. Sorimet, Sholimet, Solimet, Sulimet, or Solomon. This is where they get that from. So you have the Queen of Sapa, offset, operating through the star system Sapa, the Queen of Sapa, later corrupted into the Queen of Shaba or the Queen of Sheba. Then you have the King, Heri Met, the King of the North, Heri Met, Horimet, Sholimet, Solimet, 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 and then later Solomon in English. The Queen of the South, Queen of Saba and the King of the North meet up. These two star systems meet up every year. The Queen of Saba and the Horimet or Sholimet, later Solomon, meet up every year. And then the Queen of the South, that star system, begins to recede back towards the South, and they say she becomes pregnant with the star Heru Sapat or Heru Sapate. Heru in Sapate. Heru operates through the star system, Sapatid. He's the son of Aset who operates through the star system. So he's called Heru Amduat. He's also called Heru Sapat and so forth. Now, um, so you get down. Well, we're on page 52, by the way. Um, and we talk about those two star, star systems united. Because Aset is a wise queen, she's called Rehi which means the wise one, also is the one who gets possessed. People get possessed, horses and so forth, spiritual horses or, or mediums. Rekit, Rekut, Rekit, plural Rekut and so forth. Rekit, 
become elegun or elegun in Yoruba tradition, the ones who get possessed, the mediums. But Reki is the wise one, the one who can attune to the forces of nature. Aset is called Aset Reki. And when she's operating through the star system, Sapatit or Sirius, she's also called Aset Reki, meaning Aset the wise one. Now, because it means that in the ancient command, Heru is the son of Aset. In this constellation, he's the son of Rekit, the son of the wise one. One of the terms for progeny of offspring in ancient Kemet is Ted or Peta, meaning offspring of, progeny of. Peta Rekit means the offspring of Peta Rekit, the wise one. Peta Rekit is the offspring of the wise one. That is Heru. He's the offspring of the wise queen mother operating through the star system, Rekit. Peta Rekit. Peta, Ted or Peta in Kemet meaning offspring, becomes Ben and Bena, and Iben in so-called Arabic, Hebrew, Aramaic, and all of that. This is why Heru, Pera Rechi, becomes Bena Lechim in Amharic, Bena Lechim, the son of the wise one. This is where you get Bena Lechim, later becomes Bena Lech and Menelik, son of the wise one. In Amharic, it's Bena Lechim. Son of the wise one. Pera Rekhi becomes Ben Alekhi. This is Heru, the son of Aset Rekhi. Operating through the star system, he's the son of the wise queen. Pera Rekhi, Ben Alekhi, Menelik. There was no Menelik. There was no Osar. There was, sorry, there was no Solomon, Sheba, and Menelik at all. So the fact that Menelik II in Ethiopia called himself Menelik II, that's nonsensical because there was never a Menelik I. And the whole Kebra Nagas and the glory of kings, all of that associated with Solomon and the Ark of the Covenant, pure foolishness. It never happened. Brainwashed black people being corrupted by the whites and their offspring, trying to create little characters based on actual deities in creation to manufacture some link to Israel, all nonsense. We're talking about Solomon, Sheba, and Menelik is talking about Horimet, Sholimet, Solimet, which is the title of Alsar, king of the north. Aset, operating through Sapatit, the queen of Sapat, queen of the south. Queen of the south meets the king of the north. As you read that in the Bible when they meet. And she later goes back to the south and gives birth to her son, Menelik. And, he's gonna, and, and the rulership transfers from Israel to Ethiopia. All of that happens in the stars every year. That star system, Sapatid, meets up with Orion or Sa, Kerimet. They meet up, and then the star system separates. Day by day, gets further and further apart. It goes back to the south, and then she's pregnant and gives birth to Heru, in Ndawat, the Heru, Sapat, and so forth. And we show images of the deity Heru, Sapat. We also show images of Osar as Sa, Orion. We also show images in ancient Kemet of Aset as Aset Sapatit, operating through the star system Sapatit. So we show the trinity of Asar, Aset, and Heru through those star systems. So that's key. Um, now let's get up to another section real quick. Now we talked about how they operated through, we talked about how Heru and the whole story operates through the sun. The whole story operates through the, the cycles of the sun. Then we talked about how they operate through the cycles of the star system. The whole story plays out there as well. Now we're going to get into how the whole story plays out in your spirit, the divisions of your spirit. In your spirit, Heru governs your will. Remember we said Heru operates through the heart, the cardiovascular system, also governs the spiritual heart, which is the will. Set governs your desire. He operates through the nervous system in Gonaz, the energy electromagnetic energy circulating through your nervous system, that electromagnetic energy generates desire, your magnetism towards certain things, whether it's natural desire or unnatural desire. Natural desire, if it's hot outside and you're sweating, 
You have a magnetism to replenish yourself, and you're drawn and have a desire for water. That's a natural desire. If you've been conditioned to smoke crack or something like that, and you have this addiction and unnatural desire for crack cocaine, that's not normal. That was forced upon you, the chemicals in your system creating an unnatural desire, which otherwise wouldn't exist. So you have a desire for things that are natural or conditioned or created, manufactured, unnatural desire. Set governs the nervous system and gonads and the electromagnetic energy moving through your worldwide web in your body, the communicative faculty in the body. Set governs that, but also therefore governs the desire, that electromagnetic energy surging through your nervous system. Also and set govern your soul, the divine conscious part of your spirit. When you allow the divine part of your spirit to guide your actions, you live well. This is Osar and Offset, ruling the country as king and queen. However, sometimes you allow your misguided desires or lust to control your actions. This is Set, killing Osar, controlling your actions. Misguided desire, controlling the actions. Set, killing Osar, in order to take over the reins of control. So now your lust is controlling your actions instead of your divine consciousness controlling your actions. Set, misguided desire of lust, has overthrown divine consciousness, so to speak. As you live controlled by lust and misguided desire, you cause yourself to suffer. This is set's rule causing the people to be oppressed. At some point, you decide to make a change. You begin to look for the proper way to live your life. This is all set looking for her husband, Asar. When you have found out the truth and about how you should live and make the decision to embrace divine order over, over a lust-dominated lifestyle, this is Aset finding Asar, embracing him, and becoming pregnant with a new will, Heru, a new will to live right. As your newly born will to live right, Conflicts with your lust or misguided desire, this is Heru and Set, will and desire, the two combatants fighting. Remember early in the text when we talk about the fictional characters, Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael, one of the titles of Heru is Shek, ruler, and one of the titles of Set is Smai Ur, and Shek and Smai Ur is Ishek and Ismail, or Isaac and Ishmael, these are the two combatants fighting. And Sahuti is the judge of the two combatants. He judges between them, so he's called Uprequi, judge up of the Requi, the two combatants. Uprequi, judge of the two combatants. Uprequi, Shek and Ismail became Ibrahim, Ishek and Ismail, Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. But the two combatants are the Requi, the two combatants are Peru and Set, will to do what's right, but the desire or lust to do what's wrong, and they're fighting. When lust wins out, Set has killed Heru. Lust kills the will to do what's right. When you follow your intuition and your, your will to live right reemerges, this is Heru being resurrected from the dead by Tehuti. When you finally root out your lust and misguided desire and live according to divine law for good, Heru has defeated Set and taken over the government of your personal world. As you strive to maintain a life of harmony through seeking the guidance of your ancestresses and ancestors, this is Aset, Heru, and Nebethet resurrecting Alsar to be guided by the great ancestor. So now we went through spiritually the divisions of your spirit, how the story plays out the entire story. So we have the stellar aspect of it, how it unfolds in the, in the star, the solar aspect of it, through the solar phases, how the entire story plays out in the solar phase. Um, in, the spiritual, in your spiritual anatomy, how the entire story plays out with all the characters, with all the functions. And because these deities operate through these different aspects of your being and the world and so forth, of course, their energy interplays in the same fashion. Now we're going to look at Earth. The whole story plays out on Earth as well. On Earth, Osar, the black soil substance of Earth, is in partnership with Osset, the river waters of Earth. The partnership brings prosperity to the people. Of course, river waters, black soil gives birth to crops and so forth, and the people live and so forth. 
when the red hot desert lands of Set began to expand and dry up the black soil and the rivers, the people suffer and go hungry. Osar and Set have been removed from rulership and Set has taken over. When the river waters began to move and expand again and move over the black soil, the union of the two, river water and black soil, Osset and Osar produce vegetation drawing on the solar energy deep within the core of earth and within the sun. Through the vegetation, Heru's energy is born into the world. So when you see baby Heru rising up out of a lotus plant, the solar energy deep within the core of earth, as well as the solar energy from the sun, comes up through the green shoot, and the solar energy comes up out of the plant, and as well as, of course, oxygen coming out of plant life and so forth. That's the baby Heru being born. So you have the river water moving over the black soil, uniting, giving birth to green vegetation, and through that green vegetation, the solar energy is brought up. Osar and Osset unite to give birth to Heru so that vegetation can displace the desert eventually and heal the people and bring abundance back to the people. So what we say is... um, the people are thus returned to prosperity and free from hunger and suffering. Osar and Osset have produced the savior of the world. The hot weather of the desert threatens the existence of the new vegetation, and the vegetation dies as a result. Yet the vegetation later reemerges at a certain season. Haru has been killed and then resurrected. The vegetation grows into lush forests with great trees and vines that displace the desert. Heru has been taken has taken over the government of the world. So in ancient Kemet, you'll see that there's the river, the black land on the sides of the river, and then the desert. It's a star contrast. Every year, um, you know, the waters flood and so forth and flood the area. Then the waters recede, and eventually the uh, black soil is, you know, silt is deposited on the banks of the river. And then people go out and plant because it very rarely rains in Kemet. Um, and then, you know, sub, um, um, produce, vegetation, abundance, and so forth is, is there. Sometimes the Nile River didn't rise. It didn't inundate to the proper levels. Then the desert is choking, you know, the country, basically. Set operates through the desert. He operates through the red hot lands of the desert. He also operates through the red clay, like the red clay of Georgia and so forth. Um, but the red land he operates through, but if the water does not come and does not connect with the black soil, then set or the desert is ruling and the people are suffering, there's famine, there's hunger, and so forth under set's rule, but then eventually when the river rises to its normal height, connects with the black soil, the union of Alsar and Alset give birth to Heru, born through the vegetation, displaces the desert, and people are returned to, to you know, um, prosperity. The whole story plays out on earth. Now, in your body, the whole story plays out in the body based on the deities who govern specific organs. In your body, the pituitary gland, Osara's region, is a master gland that regulates the functions of the other glands. The male and female reproductive organs, Osara's region, have reflexive areas that are connected to all of the major organs and glands. So people will talk about the when you talk about reflexology, so to speak, what they call reflexology, just like there are points on the feet that you use the pressure points, same thing with um, acupuncture, nerve endings connected in the foot to other organs in the body, so you use these pressure points to regulate and remove blockages, energy blockages in the body to heal certain areas. These are reflexive points on the feet, reflexive points um, in the palms, Also, through acupuncture, they find the the meridians and the the points to stick the needles needles in and so forth. The womb has reflexive areas as well. The organ of the male has reflexive areas as well that are connected to different organs and glands. So when people engage in sexual activity, the reflexive points are connecting, and that realigns people and stimulates healing within the organs and glands. That's just a general principle. So... This is why we talk about 
the male and female reproductive organs, our sex region, have reflexive areas that are connected to all of the major organs and glands. The heart, Kheru's region, regulates the flow of blood and thus energy to the various organs and structures of the body. The nervous system and the testes of the male and ovaries of the female sex region governs your desire to act and your sexual desire. Now that we know our sar pituitary, our set, the male and female re reproductive organs with the reflexive area. Heru, the heart, set, the nervous system, and the gonad. Governing your desire to act and your sexual desire. Now, when one is controlled by lust, they can place an overemphasis on sexual activity. The fourth of the body's organs and structures to they, they force the body's organs and structures to feed the sex drive. The pituitary gland becomes overworked and submits to the misguided sex drive. The penis and vagina structures of the reproductive area become overworked and weakened as they submit to the misguided sex drive. The glands, organs, and structures of the body are drained of their nutrients in order to support the lust of the misguided sex drive. The body becomes, over, becomes weakened. The immune system becomes compromised. Set, dealing with desire, misguided desire, lust, as well as the nervous system, so forth, has forced Osar, the pituitary gland, into submission and offset the sex organs and their reflexive areas into submission. And the world or body is suffering under his government. An electric signal from the brain and pineal gland causes the reproductive organs and pituitary gland to begin to function in harmony again. The heart begins to um, regulate the flow of blood away from its overemphasis in the reproductive organ. Here, Alsar and Alset have reunited or realigned themselves, and Heru has begun to assume his role in government, regulating order in the body again. When your lust fights the normal functioning of the body, there is conflict. Sometimes people are so lustful, they'd rather do other things than properly get enough sleep or do whatever they're just going by lust, and they force their body to suffer. When lust fights the normal functioning of the body, there is conflict. You experience anxiety. Your heart then becomes heavy. And literally, you can feel a heavy heart, so to speak. Heart has sunk. Set has attacked, and Heru has been killed. Eventually, your heart resumes its normal rhythm. It's no longer heavy, heavy or quote unquote dead or ur ab or a still heart. Heru has been resurrected. It's palpitating at its normal rhythm again, getting back to normal. Heru reestablishes proper regulation of blood throughout the body. The organs and structures receive their proper nourishment again. Set has been defeated. So you snap out of that coma or that, you know, that trance of being, you know, addicted or controlled by sexual activity that's draining your body of nutrients and everything else, and you get back to normal and start acting in a normal fashion, sending the right energy to the various organs of the body and start functioning properly. Set has been defeated. Um, so that's in the body. In the moon, Alsar and Alset also operate, function through the moon, called Abjo and Ajuwa and Akan. The moon is called Yah in the language of Kemet. So this is where they get Yah or Jah, fake deity in, in um, so-called Hebrew and so forth. The moon is called Yah. This is the moon. In Coptic, Yah becomes Yo, Yo. And then in Akan, moon day or Monday is called Jo Da or Joa Da, the day of Jo, the coolness of the moon. And the deities are Adjo and Adjoa, which is Alsar and Alset operating through the moon. Alsar is connected with the new moon, which is black. Alsar is often depicted as a perfectly black god. As a spirit operating through the new moon, Alsar has the title Alsar Ya. In Akan, that would be Alsar Jo or Ajo. Alset is connected with the full moon. As the light of the moon begins from a crescent shape to expand day after day, it gradually covers the entire blackness of the new moon to become a full moon after nearly 15 days. Offset 
has just come over the perfectly black god Osar to become a pregnant or full moon with the light of the sun, Heru. Aset as the full or pregnant moon transmits that sunlight to earth. Heru is thus called Heru Ya or Kensu Ya, Heru operating through the moon. The light reaches earth and the people who were in darkness. The full moon is then reduced to a three-quarter moon. The black crescent shape begins to expand until the entire moon is dark after nearly 15 days. Now, the crescent shape is coming from the other side of the moon, the black crescent, and then it covers the moon. That means Set has removed the light, and the people of Earth are in darkness again. Heru has been killed. In about three days after the moon is dark, in about three days, the silver light of the crescent appears from the face of the dark moon. Heru, or Hemsu, has been resurrected on the third day. The crescent light expands into a full moon. The light reaches the people of Earth. Set has been defeated. The people of Earth are no longer in darkness. So now we talk, we talk about the moon. So we have the Osana, Oset, Heru, the story operating through the stellar, on the stellar level, with Sa, Orion, Sapatit, Sirius, and so forth. Set, of course, operating through Mesketi, the Great Bear, um, operating through the stellar region, then operating through the cycles of the sun, operating through the, the earth, operating through the physical body, operating through um, the different divisions of your spirit. On every level, this whole story unfolds the same way on every level. And now we just talked about the moon, how it's unfolding through the moon with the various abosom in the same function. And then finally, operating through the lives and events that take place within the clans of Afurakani, Afurakani people. Asar, Aset, Heru, Set, Nebethet, and Sahuti. So you have Asar, the great black king who's murdered by Set, who is often depicted as red. Asar is called Kam Ur, or the great black one. In traditional culture, the king represents the nation, just like the queen mother would represent the ancestresses and ancestors of the community because she can receive She's more receptive. She can get possessed by the ancestresses and ancestors. She's a representation to the people of the ancestral community, their morals, their admonitions, their culture. The king is a representation of the people um, to the ancestral community. This is why he's a priest king. He communicates with the ancestresses and ancestors on behalf, uh, I mean, yeah, on behalf of the people. So all that the people can be is summed up in the body of the king, and he represents them to the ancestral community, to the royal ancestresses and ancestors, while the queen mother represents the ancestresses and ancestors to our people. So as Kam Ur, or the great black one, also the great black nation. Then you have Seth, who became the king through negative means, representing the great, quote-unquote, reddish nation. The whites and their offspring, when they invaded Kemet, they came from the desert regions, they began to call themselves children of Set. Not that Set embraced them, because, of course, he never did. Eshu, Set, Anansi have absolutely nothing to do with the whites and their offspring. But they began to associate themselves because they lived in the de desert. They started calling themselves children of Set and saying they were worshippers of Set. Set had nothing to do with them. But this is what they called themselves. Um, and they were coming from the desert. So you have the great black king, Kampur, the great black nation, murdered by Set, who was often depicted as red. The Afurakanu, Afurakaitnu, the great black nations of earth, destroyed by misguided desire, operating within a small portion of black people. So some people, black people, become criminals. You know, some black people decide they're going to work with the whites and their offspring. We always have traitors. You have some cells in your body that become cancerous, and they begin to attack all the other cells until your immune system kills them. So some Negroes, sellouts, decide they're going to go against other black people, and then they ally with the whites and their offspring. And initially, the whites and their offspring who were invading Kemet, they weren't powerful enough to take over Kemet. They would follow up behind some of the criminals. Then eventually, they would overtake the criminals, and then the whites would be in charge. 
the criminals thinking that they will be able to be in charge of the whites and lead them against their black adversaries, not realizing that the whites were eventually going to overtake them in their criminality and even rule over them. So you have the Negroes, um, a small, you know, um, this guy desire operating within a small portion of black people controlled by lust, and a large group of reddish or white foreigners from the deserts of Eurasia who were their followers. So, again, just like we have in our community now, for example, when black people get gunned down by the police, you have these Negro police who will stand up and, and speak on behalf of the police. And you have, you have Negroes just across the board. And they ally with the whites and their offspring today. We've had that for thousands of years. You always had sellouts, turncoats, and so forth. Usually they end up getting consumed by the whites and their offspring. Like an overseer who will whip the black people on the plantation for the whites, they would end up getting consumed and tortured by the whites anyway. So they always lose out. But they're used as tools against our people until the whites can take over and crush them as well. This is what happened in ancient Kemet. Um, so this is what we're talking about. The deserts of Eurasia, the foreigners who came from the deserts of Eurasia, trying to identify themselves with the deity of the deserts, which is Set. Set takes the body of Osar, throws it in the river, and proceeds to, then proceeds to take control of the country. Here are the white foreigners, now they've taken over. They've taken over from the sellout blacks. Now the whites are in control. The Greeks and other people, even before them, the Persians and the Syrians and so forth, they're in control. Um, and, and later, the whites in our spring are in control. Um, Seth takes the body of Alsar, throws it in the river, and proceeds to take control of the country. Here the white foreigners of Europe and Asia take the bodies of black people and throw them in the water. The beginning of the slave trade um, of millions of Afurakanu Afurakainu who are forced into ships and sent into the waters of the ocean. We have an article, Kam Ur, Kamet Uri, Asar, Aset, and the Enslavement and Restoration of Afurakani Afurakaini People in the West. You show the symbol, of, the image of Asar, the great black one, placed in that coffin. Was set, placed, placed the great black one in the coffin and seals it up and throws the coffin in the water and kills them. The great black nation is thrown into a coffin, slave ships, thrown into the water and sent across the water. Um, the white foreigners then take control of the black nations, create unlawful rules and regulations. Offset is forced out of her role as queen and goes to search for her husband. This is the remnant of black people who are forced out of their countries yet survive the wars and escape slavery. These Afurakanu Afurakaitnu would search for their sisters and brothers who were still in bondage. Aset finds the body of Osar, performs ritual, communicates with his spirit, and becomes pregnant. Afurakanu Afurakaitnu would escape slavery like the Maroon, like the Okofo, the warriors and warriorses who escaped the plantation, went into the northern region and the swamps, hiding out in the swamps, just like there were papyrus swamps in northern Kemet. And Aset was hiding out in the swamps and became impregnated and gave birth to Heru in the swamps. Afurakanu, Afuraikaitnu, who had escaped slavery, would find their sisters and brothers on the plantations and seek to unite with them and build alliances with them to plan for freedom from the white slavery. The god Tahuti tells Aset that her son will grow up to defeat Set and that she must hide away in the swamps to raise Heru away from the seat of government. Gover government. Akurakanu Afrakaitan, who escaped slavery, set up their own sovereign, independent nations in the swamps and forests and mountains away from the plantation. We gave birth to children who would grow to become those who would defeat the rule of the white slaver. These are the maroon societies who waged war and destroyed enslavement. Set finds out about Heru's birth and has him killed. The white slavers plot against the Afurakani, Afurakani males and females, creating drugs and diseases that we use to destroy ourselves and thus maintain white rule that includes crack cocaine and everything else. The followers, the purported pseudo-followers of Set, find out that the revolutionaries are being born, 
so they decide they have to kill all the newborn, you know, firstborn children who may grow up to destroy their rule. So they flood our communities with marijuana, alcohol, crack cocaine, heroin, false religion, and everything else to kill our people. And some of our people are stupid enough to think that smoking marijuana and doing other drugs is okay and causes us to have super spiritual powers and all kinds of nonsense brainwashed by the purported followers of Seth, the whites and their offspring. And we're dying as a result. So um, then we get to the point, and, and therefore we use these things to destroy ourselves, and that maintains white rule. The goddesses are set and never had fine Heru murdered and lament his death. The mothers of Afurakani, Afurakani, males as well as females, lament as they bury their children daily as a result of violence, drugs, and diseases created by the whites. The goddess Serket tells our set to call on Ra. Ra sends Tehuti to cause the resurrection of Heru. We are reminded by our ancestresses and ancestors that our liberation is only possible through the invocation of the goddesses and gods, the Abosom. We begin to invoke Ra and Ra'et and the spirits of the goddesses and gods, the Abosom, the Arish, and so forth. And the sons and daughters of Afura Kanu, Afura Kainu, begin to wake up. So when we talk about we're suffering under diseases and drugs and violence and criminality and white oppression, Serket tells Offset. And Nebit had, hey, you need to call on Ra and Ra'et. And once she calls on Ra, then Tehuti is sent down, divine wisdom is sent down, and that resurrects Heru. Once we invoke the divinities, we attune to divine wisdom, we get back involved in our ancestral culture, then the children are beginning to awaken, to arise. This is why Nanasom, Afurakani, Afurakani, the ancestral religion, is on the map, and we're expanding the knowledge of Nana Song to awaken our people. Now, Heru, with Heru Behudet, the son of Ra, defeats Set and establishes divine order in the world. Heru is the son of Asar and Aset. Heru Behudet, or Benna, is the son of Ra. The children of those who were captured and enslaved away from Afuraka, Afuraikai, are united with the children of those who were colonized in Afuraka, Afuraikai, and are defeating the whites and their offspring and their false religions and perverse culture for good. Aset, Nebethet, and Heru resurrect Osar, and Osar rejoins joins Ra in heaven as a god in nature. The children of those Afurakanu, Afurai Kaitnu, who were separated from Afuraka, Afurai Kait, began to evoke the spirits of the ancestresses and ancestors, who then come forth and open, openly exercise their jurisdiction over the lives of their children. So we resurrect, communicate, establish our ancestral shrines, resurrect our ancestral fathers and mothers like Osars resurrected. We free ourselves, but the way you maintain the freedom that you have established. It's through communication with the ancestresses and ancestors to get proper guidance um, on how to establish a civilization, maintain the civilization. The ancestresses and ancestors have knowledge of true story, what has taken place in the past, how we made missteps, and how to overcome that so we can prevent making the same mistakes. They have that accumulated wisdom, so we must evoke them. And so the final piece here. Jesus never existed, Mary never existed, Yeshua ben Pandera never existed, whites have no special connection to God, nor have they been visited by God's fictional only begotten son, the name of the gods and goddesses that were corrupted by the whites and applied to their fictional characters are names of spiritual forces in creation that have always operated through the sun, moon, planets, stars, our physical bodies, and our spirits, and continue to operate through the families and clans of Afurakanu, Afuraikanu. So, that's just one section of the book, Kukutuntun, the Ancestral Jurisdiction, dealing with the Osar, Set, and Heru, 
peace, showing these are deities that function in creation. Um, there's only five minutes left, and it will actually cut off. In it, it will literally cut off even on the phone lines um, because you know we went into three hours. Um, so just let us say um, we have our our publications. Let me put the link up here. All, this book that we were reading from, Kukutunsun, The Ancestral Jurisdiction, as well as the other publications, we have 15 books. All of them you can go to our website. You can download all of them right now for free. We always make all of our books free, the ebook version. We also publish the soft cover version, which we print ourselves in house and in color on our own printers. Of these 15 books, and they range between eight and $11. If you order 10 books or more, say you order the first 10 books or you order the whole 15 book set, any order of 10 books or more is automatically 30% off. So for example, 10 books um, normally would be $96, but the discount makes it $66. Um, the entire 15 book set is $99. So you get 15 books for $99, that's, of course, less than $10 per book. So um, $99 plus shipping. The shipping is like $9. So in total, it's $108. That includes the shipping cost um, for all 15 books. So we make them as inexpensive as possible, less, generally less than um, $10 on average per book um, with a discount. So yet I'll say for those who have supported the books, please um, make your purchases if you if you, are, you know, appreciate the information, um, this is what allows us to continue to provide free workshops, um, classes, and everything else. We are also, we have a fundraising campaign to establish a physical permanent location for our institution. All of the publications we produce, including the books, as well as the 60-plus articles, all of the videos, all of the knowledge that comes forward comes from our institution. We teach classes, workshops, and different things. We need a instead of renting out places all the time, we're, we're working to establish a permanent location where we can expand our service to the community, including the substance abuse abstinence ritual methods where we've helped people get off of, you know, um, drugs and alcohol and everything else, domestic violence ritual method to overcome the negative effects of that, intergenerational trauma, as well as the classes. We're going to have everything at the center. We will live stream classes for those who cannot come and participate physically. We will also have employment opportunities in the publishing arm because we publish our books. We send them wherever people order them around the world. We can have people doing the copying, printing, um, shipping, and so forth. So there will be employment opportunities for people in the community, no matter what the work history is, as well as the uh, distribution fees. People can start that now. You can become a distributor of our books. Um, simply by uh, going to the Homa page and purchase the book wholesale, and you can sell them and generate money for yourself. We can employ our people through our work and impact the community in a positive fashion. Uh, if you look at the GoFundMe,